bist du sehr aller Ehre. Was ist Wundes hier geschehe? Dass ein Magd ein Kind gebar, hier über alle This is The New Right, a podcast for the lost arts, reclaiming the literary holy land from the heathen. This is Matt Pegas. Unfortunately, I'm again not joined by my normal co-host, Dan Baltic, who is out on a sexy book tour for his new novel, uh, Nutcranker, which is coming out with Terror House soon. So he couldn't join us today, but uh, that's OK, because I have two other very prominent guests. I'm going to intro both of them. One of them. Some would say needs no introduction. Thomas seven seven seven, legendary poster uh, online. Uh, you know, Sallow for, used to post on Sallow form back in the day. This was all before my time. I'm you know like Aaron. I'm, I'm a little younger to this, but I definitely you know first came across your work uh, when you started going on BAPS podcast, Caribbean Rhythms, and around 2020. And I'm um, I'm a big fan, so it's it's an honor to meet you, Thomas. Thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for hosting me, man. I appreciate it very much. Yeah, and I'm also joined by Aaron Cummings, um, who is a little bit new to my radar, um, but he is definitely an exciting and very vital new voice, I would say. Um, you know, Aaron reached out to me about having Thomas on, and I, I admit that was kind of the first time I come across his work, but uh, I don't know how you'd introduce yourself, Aaron, but to me, it kind of seems like you are the, uh, and I hope this name doesn't have negative connotations. I mean it in a good way. You're like the Nick Fuentes of the Fresno State College Republicans. Is this accurate? <laughs> yeah, that's one way of describing it. Um, yeah, politics isn't my exclusive niche, but definitely, uh, thanks to Thomas, among others, it's uh, it's kind of one of the things in my toolbox. So I appreciate the, the compliment. Yeah, no, I, I do get that. And again, I, I'm not like, I think probably all of us, you know, have the positive and negative things to say about Nick Fuentes. But by that, I just mean that you have that sort of charisma and you have that way of talking about, um, you know, you describe yourself as a paleo conservative, which I guess Fuentes might also describe himself as such. Um, you know, you have that way of talking about the issues, which I think cuts through uh, in, in a really, really effective way. So, but anyways, welcome both of you uh, to the show. Um, I guess to start out, um, I was kind of interested in, so, so you, oh, I, I should probably back up a step. You, you, Aaron, um, you have your live stream loud sound epicenter on YouTube, uh, where you, yeah, you're talking about politics, but you're also talking about music, specifically rock and roll. Thomas, you're essentially a co host on that or a regular guest. So, I was kind of, I thought maybe we just start like, how did, how did this collaboration come to be? Well, sure. Aaron, well you yeah, are no, no. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, interrupt you. Um, Aaron reached out to me. Um, on Twitter, uh, like a little bit less than a year ago. I mean, it seems like longer, not because it's been like a drag, quite the contrary, but we've, we've done a lot of things together. So, but he reached out to me, I mean, because we had, you know, I, I, I write a lot about culture issues and stuff, you know, I mean, I actually, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm like a theoretically oriented guy. You know, I write a lot about political theory and historical right. revisionism. I mean, I'm not a guy who really writes about, you know, like current events. I write a lot about the Ukraine situation and stuff, because I mean, it's a war and peace, uh, affair yeah. and but i mean i'm not a guy who like writes about you know uh like like the the you know I, i'm not like a, i'm not like a beltway watcher or something but i yeah. do write a lot about culture stuff uh, i mean because i think that's important and it it kind of it, it relates very much to kind of you know my topical topical focus and uh you know that's kind of an errand wheelhouse so like he reached out to me and we started talking about that kind of stuff and at first, you know, like I said, I'm kind of like a tech retard. I mean, not just because of my age, but because I just not, I, I'm not like super comfortable with it. Um, oh, yeah. I never have been, you know, um, but so he started, you know, he was kind of to help me out with a lot of sort of, you know, like my kind of tech needs and things as I, as I kind of returned, you know, to content writing on mm -hmm. and production online. And then, you know, I, I, I just kind of suggested, you know, we should collaborate on more stuff. And I mean, he was amenable to that. And, you know, we got a good rapport and stuff. And I mean, it's kind of went from there, you know, you, 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 it's, it's, 
<laughs> there's not a lot of rhyme or reason to how you come to develop a you know a, a strong relationship with people you know personally or professionally. It's, it's kind of the intangibles, right. but that's it was basically like that. I mean, he he was nice enough to reach out to me and because he he liked the stuff that I was producing and you know offered to help any way he could. You know, and he's been a great I him uh, Paul Fahrenheit. You know, my dear friend Kerry, who uh, you know helps with the podcast. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I I'm not just being nice. It wasn't for them. Like I I, I would not be nearly as far along in terms of, you know, being able to promote my brand. I got the guys in Imperium Press, you know, who, who I, I, I published my print stuff through. Right. I mean, they're great and they help, but still it's only part of the equation. So that's, that, that's basically the, the long and short of it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, the, well, the rapport is definitely there. I mean, you can, it's definitely something that you, you know, it's palpable while watching, you know, the stuff you guys do. And, you know, there is that intergenerational aspect that, you know, it's kind of cool. There is that give and take, like you've obviously been in, this kind of scene for longer than than any of us and you have all this experience i mean i don't want to uh, you know i don't want to put i hope i hope neither of you take this the wrong way but yeah that intergenerational element with you know thomas as as the older guy with the experience and aaron with uh you know with the energy and with the the tech uh expertise well uh, no that's why that's yeah. also why i guess seek out younger people i mean that's a, there's too many guys you, you become kind of i mean you don't you don't want to develop echo chambers um, either because your content creation is just kind of, you know, your your own endless monologue, but also there's too many guys who who spend their time kind of exclusively among their own age coterie or their own kind of professional demographic for guys who work a nine to five job, you know, who aren't just content creators. And I make sure I don't do that. And, you know, younger people, because I don't have kids, you know, like I, mm. I, I kind of learn what I know about younger people by just like talking to people that it like just out and about that I, you know, I'm, I, I talk to a lot of people just kind of cause I like, you know, just everywhere I go and like I travel a lot, but you yeah. know, I, I, younger people have got energy, but they, when that's, and that's essential, but they also they got insight into the culture that I don't. So yeah, that that's a big part of it. Yeah, no, it's, well, yeah. And Aaron, you do come from this Gen Z perspective, which I think is what a lot, you know, again, not, not to use this name again, but as with Fuentes, I think that is what gives, you know some of your insights a lot of strength is that they're they're coming from this place of understanding you know gen z obviously every generation is different but i think we can all agree that you know gen z and the crossover into you know people who just totally grew up um on the internet uh you know that that's a pretty big cultural leap and, and it's kind of interesting to see people come out of that like you aaron with uh you know a more right-wing or paleo paleo conservative um point of view and i think that's reflected you know in, in a lot of the topics you you're talking about um in your in your in your lectures up there at fresno state uh it like with topics like bio leninism in the 21st century and the sex your recent one the sexual revolution and gen z identity i mean these are these are terms that people would call very online but they're not very online in the way that like memes are very online where it's like you need to be within a certain online subculture to understand them maybe they are that to a certain extent but they're also these kind of cut it you know concepts like bioleninism and you know the specific sexual weirdness of gen z uh which i know thomas 77 knows something about he with the <laughs> name snorlax tweet which <laughs> couldn't get too far in this podcast without without name dropping um where was i going with that basically just that uh, i just i guess another compliment for aaron that that's i think uh, what gives give, gives your work uh, a lot of its strength. I don't know if you want to comment on that. I know you also, I, I also wanted to kind of name drop um, Catherine D, who's a frequent, you know, a friend of this pod and, and someone you reference a lot. You know, it's interesting. Yeah, she's a, good, she, she's a good friend of mine. I mean, in real life, like we hang out, you know. Oh, um, yeah, she's in Chicago too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I took her to lunch just uh, last week. But no, she, she's she's a real sweetheart, man. She's dope. I, I, I really, really have got a lot of love for her. Yeah, no, she, she's done. She's done me a lot. She's done me a lot of favors too, frankly. Uh, substantial professional risk to herself because I mean, not because I'm radioactive or some kind of horrible perverted beast or something, but I mean, I'm not a guy who is really gonna, you know, do great things for you to be associated with if you're a, you know, if you're a lady who's a who's pretty much like a mainstream conservative journalist. So right. I don't have any nice things to say about her. She's a real sweetheart and adult content creator in her own right. And a dear friend. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, Catherine's, a, as I said, a friend of this pod, and we're hoping to have her back on again soon. Yeah. I mean, the way that she, uh, again, her, we, Aaron and I were sort of talking about this before we started recording. Um, you know, the way certain people within 
within this corner of um, of our thing, shall we say, uh, find ways to sort of cut through to different audiences. You know, the it's it's not like anyone has like intense PR considerations. It's just that you know it's the way you frame things, um, and I think that someone like Catherine and and a lot of us just even Geo, you know, there's that kind of more journalistic uh, notion where you're not putting ideology or flag waving of any sort first, but rather, you know, you're really trying to engage with, you know, ser- this Catherine D is a good example of this, you know, serious questions affecting society and affecting people within society and affecting social behavior that like they're, they're not as politically correct to ask. But, you know, I think in a grow, I think one of the things that's really given this scene a lot of energy, uh, especially, you know, since like 2020 is I think that even like a much more quote unquote normie audience is starting to realize that these questions matter you know the types of questions that aren't addressed by either major political party but rather that you have to you know look to um you know just to give one you know people people like the people that you know you you thomas and you aaron and often in your dialogues that you you know talk about uh paleo conservatives older right-wing thinkers um you know even or even even not even outside the right people like uh christopher lash you know, these thinkers who have kind of been swept under the rug a little bit, I think, are um, coming back to the forefront of like the more cutting edge of uh, sociological inquiry, shall we say. Well, yeah, that's also, you know, one of the things I make the point to people a lot. <clears throat> the sort of monopoly on, you know, like, on, on the intellectual canon that was held by, you know, the university system. Pretty much for I mean, for decades you know, for, yeah. for perennially that, that, that really came to an end. Um, it's, I mean, it, I, I, I say it past tense because, you know, it's not, I mean, the process is still underway to some degree, but they mm-hmm. really, they, they really kind of canceled themselves out of relevancy, you know, through their own mm-hmm. kind of, uh, yeah, through, through their own kind of rigid enforcement of uh, their own ideological strictures, you know, people just stop taking them seriously. And to be competitive, and you know, the, if I, you know, if I can invoke an overused uh, cliche, you know, uh, the market to be competitive in the marketplace of ideas, uh, you know, now that we're you know three decades into the information age, you know, you can't, uh, you can't, you can't approach things that way. You know, you just can't. Um, yeah. So that's even. Yeah, I mean, even people who aren't particularly right wing. You know, they view they view universities as like out of touch and like very staid and very, um, you know, not not really particularly relevant to the culture um and that gave us a real opportunity and i kind of saw that happening i mean i kind of predicted that 20 years ago um i mean even though i'm not at all like a tech person um i i do think i have a pretty decent sense of what how, how technology is impactful on on political values and things you mm-hmm. know when rubber meets the road too and in, in terms of people's social behavior I mean, because I made a study of that kind of stuff. I mean, guys like guys like Toffler, the guy wrote Future Shock. That was that's a book that I take seriously. Mm-hmm. I mean, I did and I do, um, you know, uh, to this day. But it, I mean, it began back on me back in college. But you know, as 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 the internet kind of started jumping off in earnest, even when people in right wing circles, you know, even when we were on Usenet, and we only, you know, like the the the, the chairs we hang out on, and like only had like twelve guys on them on a good day. You know, it's like I realized like at some point. Um, this is going to become not just mainstream, but you know the uh, the kind of the, the kind of university mafia, and and its and uh, and its ability to just kind of shut out um, you know intellectual strains and and, and thinkers and 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 mm-hmm. schools of thought that it just that it just kind of arbitrarily declares you know like are not acceptable like that that's over you know so it um that's yeah. um no so, I yeah I th- no, that go ahead I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. Um, I mean, I went to college from 2013 to 2017. So I feel like I almost started to see that happen in real time where like, you know, uh, the political, it's not even like just to be whining about woke and politically correct all day, but like, just as you articulated pretty well, just the way that universities sort of box themselves into a hyper specific and hyper moralistic, like one line of group think and line within New York times and whatever else. And, you know, obviously people have always accused, you know, since the dawn of time or whatever have accused universities of being sort of out of touch, but like it, it within the American context, like even in the, you know, the eighties and nineties, you had academics like Camille Paglia. And uh, I mean, I know you um, speak very positive, John Mearsheimer, who's still, you know, over there at university, you know, yeah. there's obviously worthwhile people 
in, in, in academia, but, you know, the overall notion that a university is a place where you can go and actually explore things on a more open basis, I think, is beginning to fade away as our star kind of in this corner of the internet or just on the internet in general rises, you know, it seems like a, a better time. Well, than ever. yeah, and I'll tell yeah. you something. I make this point a lot, and I mean, it's important. It's not it's not just some, like, old guy take about, like, the, you know, the changing world. You know, when I was, uh, I, I graduated high school in 1994, and if you, you know, in, in those, you know, 30 years ago, um, you were basically limited in terms of the resources you get access, you know, you're, to the public library system, wherever you were situated. I mean, yeah. I was better off than some people because I had Chicago public libraries, which is fucking huge. Yeah. You know, and, but just the same, it's like, you can literally re-access any book ever written um, fairly easily, you know, from your home. I mean, that's, that's yeah. insane. And no, so it is like, insane. I, it still shocks me sometimes. I yeah. think, you know, I'm now, yeah, go on. No, part of the reason you go to, you go to a university is, you know, to, to interact with other people your age and so that, you know, you could, you know, you could have dialogue with, with learning people, you know, in the form of your professors. But the main thing was, you know, the resources, the, whether you study in the hard sciences, you'd have the labs you needed, or, but it's, it was mainly, you know, like the library system they had, you know, yeah. like you take it out of the equation and there's really no reason to go there. You know I mean? Except unless, you know, again, it's, yeah. you know, you're, you're dealing with some kind of like applied technology field where you kind of like need like, you know, resources in the form of hardware, like lab access. And even at a place where I went to Loyola because the history department there, I mean, I, I studied political theory there, but, and mm -hmm. economics, but they did, there was a right wing uh, coterie in the history department. Um, but even some of the philosophy classes I took, like at that time, you know, I was, I was reading a lot of science fiction because I always do and I always have rather, you know, I'm a big Heidegger guy. And, you know, in a lot of science fiction, there's a lot of, there's a lot of callbacks to Heidegger because, what he said about consciousness, you know, uh, um, it, it, it's it's relevant to, you know, kind of thoughts on um, that people like early neuroscience pioneers developed. Yeah. But I remember seeing these philosophy professors like, you know, they'd ask me, like, what kind of stuff I'm reading? I tell them, they laugh, you know, nobody reads that. And it's like, bro, all kinds of people read that. You talk to like five other guys on this university faculty and you just like decide like that that's not acceptable anymore. But yeah. it's like, what do you mean nobody reads that? It's like everybody, everybody I talked to reads Heidegger, man. Like no, people, even like left wingers did at that time, you know. So it's like that. Oh, that yeah. just kind of hit me. Yeah, I mean, this was a long time ago, but it's, I, think, I was thinking at that time, like, oh wow, these guys don't know what the fuck is going on in terms of just kind of like the culture. But yeah, go ahead. Were they Straussians? I, that was one thing I like. We were going to talk about. Uh, yeah, like a, a lot of them were, and in Chicago, you know, University University of Chicago. There, there was at that time a very strong Straussian kind of coterie. Right. At Loyola, they, it was not nearly, they didn't have nearly the clout they did at the University of Chicago, but in the philosophy department, like the right, the, the quote right wing guys at the philosophy, the philosophy department at Loyola in the 90s were Straussians. The history yeah. department, they actually were like right wing dudes, like not that revisionists history. like me, but, but they, yeah, but guys who were, you know, uh, who genuinely like, you know, like white Christian right wing dudes. I mean, they were yeah. Catholic, obviously, but it's, yeah. Yeah, that's actually that's interesting. Yeah, maybe there was more at that time anyway. Maybe there was more leeway within a history department. I, I mean, I, I feel like today even the history departments are probably you know pretty pretty dominated by by group think. But yeah, I did want to bring up um, you know you have Thomas, you have this list of, of books for dissidents, and one of the you know we're not going to talk about all of them, but since this is a lit podcast, I did want to bring that list up. And one book yeah. that was on it that I also know, Aaron, you were posting about. Maybe you recently read it. It's a book that I've read at least sections of is Paul Gottfried's Leo Strauss and the uh, conservative <laughs> movement in, in America. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that and before I guess before getting into the book proper. I wanted to add a point. I don't are you either of you or both of you familiar with Michael Millerman, who writes a lot about um, Alexander Dugan. He's kind of one of the translators of Dugan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've but he's also stuff, like yeah. a little bit. Go on. Sorry. No, I haven't read his stuff. I've been deep dive into his stuff, but I, I know I'm going to. Alexander Dugan's work, and I, 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 I subscribe to Dugan's Telegram channel just because right. I think Dugan's an interesting guy, and yeah, I, I, I noticed that a lot of the English translations come through him. But yeah, no, he's one of it yeah. was Richard Spencer's wife and or ex-wife and him, or, or maybe the, pretty much some of the only ones doing it right now. But anyway, I bring him up because he's he's interesting. I want to get him on this pod at some point too. So Michael, if you're listening, come on. But um, he, you know, he he's the translator of Dugan and he it, has done a lot of interesting work on Heidegger, but he's also, he, he kind of started as a Straussian. 
Uh, maybe that's neither here nor there, but he, he kind of has this interesting breadth of knowledge of different political thinkers. But what he says about Strauss, which I th- I'm sure you'll agree with, I don't even think, it, maybe it's Paul Gottfried who said it more originally, but basically for a while, and, and maybe even still now, uh, Strauss represented, and this almost was, you could almost look at his entire project this way, Strauss was the furthest right you could be in any political science department in America. Like that, that the bulwark uh, of that realm of thought was like, this is as far right, quote unquote, as you can be within an academic system. It's like, you know, and, and then and therefore control, you know, make sure no one goes any to the anywhere to the right of that, but rather kind of keep. I mean, I've got, yeah, I've got a few ideas on that. I mean, that's, so, yeah, I, I, in a sense, that's true. Okay. Because um, it, it, what's, what passes for, you know, right wing academia was Straussians, at least in the 90s. And it seemed like in the early 2000s, even though I was out of college by then. But the key thing about Strauss is that Strauss actually isn't right wing in any conventional sense. He's got a certain right wing style. And uh, he he disdained uh, uh, a lot of the excesses of, 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 of liberals, like American liberals, especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, you know, Strauss at base, he was a German Jew and those guys came at issues a certain way. Mm -hmm. And uh, they 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 were they were socially conservative people in some basic sense. Okay, but Strauss, uh, Strauss, uh, Strauss is not right wing in the sense of any in any traditional sense. You know, I mean, um, he kind of developed and and, I mean, we're kind of we're, we're. in some ways, I think that the, this is kind of probably kind of outside the scope of this podcast episode, but I, I kind of think of the 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 the, uh, the, the ideology of uh, of America today is is kind of a Straussian paradise because it's nakedly revolutionary, it's 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 radically left wing, but it's it, it's violently expansionist and it's it's yeah. it's highly intolerant of of any competitor political culture. You know, I mean, it's there. I think it's kind of the hangover that people still have of thinking of militarism of any sort as quote right wing or political violence as right wing or like manly or something. And that's that's sort of a hangover from the '60s. Mm-hmm. And traditionally, like it doesn't really make sense. It's like, well, I mean, there's nobody who was more kind of militant than Trotsky. I mean, like, does that was he right wing because he you like yeah, to kill yeah, people? Right. I mean, yeah. like, I don't. So that's 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 the only qualifier I'd throw out there. But yeah, otherwise, I agree. It's anybody. Um, you can be quote right wing uh, on a university campus if yeah if you're a Straussian and you know you hate you hate Islamists and you hate the Russians and you know you're you're uh, yeah. you're either neutral on LGBTQ or you're enthusiastic about it yeah yeah I mean yeah yeah no and and Aaron you recently also checked out uh, that Paul Gottfried right. <laughs> um, I actually haven't read the whole book, but well, I, me neither. I mean, it's it's one of those things, but yeah. But yeah, I, I wanted to promote it on Twitter because I, I think it may have been Thomas who uh, who got me onto it. And Paul Gottfried is someone who's helped me out a lot. I like him a lot. And he's uh, kind of helped me make sense of neoconservatism. And uh, outside of some Twitter people like BookCat and Wendell, who have also been, I, I mean, essential for me to understand a lot of the networking that happens on the right in physical space and online, I, I think Gottfried's a, a great re- uh, resource for people because it's just... I don't, it's almost like a new school of thought into understanding politics because uh, to go off of like what you guys are just saying about political violence, I was going through uh, a couple months back, Josh Neal's book on Imperium yeah. Press. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, like something as simple as just saying, you know, the categorization of political violence is so arbitrary because we just conventionally look at it as a right wing personality. But obviously, I mean, just breaking down that one barrier is enough for people to like really step outside the like left right paradigm and and see that like political violence could really i mean that's what should be taught in like un- uh, university settings the fact that there is a way to like get radicals to not go down the extremist route because people who are going to be agitated in the foreseeable future are going to need some type of detoxing some kind of resource but of course when you read like vice journalists they tell you you need to pivot to the middle you need to water down your views and obviously that's that's not the 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 right thing to do but where is the palatable right-wing space for radicals who you know are not really these anti-social weirdos you know there there is that that distinction That's a good point. So, yeah yeah well where do, where do you think that space is i mean i have something i could propose as an answer but i'm curious no go for yeah. it because i'm well, also just figuring it out yeah no if i if i and it's a little bit of uh it's it's gonna sound a little uh 
fruity to say, but it, you know, this, <laughs> you know, this is a, this is a literary podcast where obviously we, Aaron and I were talking about this before we started recording um, the sort of artistic uh, space on the right. I, I think, I think, you know, it, um, Rather than uh, engaging in political violence, I, I do. I, I you know, not, not that I'm like some feminist art therapist or something, but I do think uh, you know there's something there's something to the idea of uh, you know kind of putting that energy into creative rather than destructive work. I don't know if that resonates, but well, it's also. I mean, I, I'll make the point. Um, violence is kind of overemphasized um, across the political spectrum, either either in uh, I, I, either in being glorious ways or or in a, or, 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 you know, or cast, you know, in absolutely punitive terms. Mm. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I, I recently on my podcast, you know, we took up Clausewitz and the fact, uh, I, I take strong exception to Clausewitz's victims and things. Um, mm. but, uh, I mean, the, what, how that relates to the point it is made is that, uh, you know, uh, um, warfare doesn't solve a lot of problems. There's very specific problems that it resolves and there's very specific kind of crises where you know a military solution is called for, but uh, on the same spectrum, uh, violence uh, can't really be extricated from evolutionary activity because the potentiality of it is always there. Yeah, if you're, if you're a revolutionary, you must be prepared to take somebody's life, even if you adopted something of a defensive posture. You know, because uh, you you have to meet existential threats uh, to yourself and your comrades and kind. But uh, this idea that killing people or the willingness to kill people or, uh, you know, the strength of a, of a gesture, you know, to terrify the opposing force or the civilian population that sustains the opposing force is somehow, you know, always adequate or always sufficient to develop the momentum to, to facilitate a revolutionary paradigm shift that's highly misguided. Um, and there's a big, there's a real problem because like once you get into wars, uh, you know, anywhere on the conflict spectrum, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, whether we're talking about an asymmetrical conflict like Northern Ireland, we literally had just kind of like a vanguard of 100 guys, you know, uh, waging war against uh, a, 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 a conventional state power, or whether you're talking about like two similarly situated combatants in conventional set piece combat, you know, once you get into wars, they tend to be very difficult to get out of, you know, you do not want to just pull that trigger because you think like it'll all work itself out. You know, once uh, once you take that step, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think it's. I think I think it's reckless for guys to talk about such things anyway, um, in public and semi-public spaces for all kinds of reasons that should be obvious. Um, so I try and steer people away from that. But in terms of purely academic conversations, you know, um, that couldn't be mistaken uh, or uh, or uh, or proven up in a court of law is is actually intro crimes. Or conspiratorial affairs, you know. I emphasize to people that you know you really, you you really shouldn't fetishize this kind of thing. You oh, know, uh, yeah. yeah. Nor nor and nor should you pretend like it will just you know if you kill if you were able, if you were somehow hypothetically able to kill enough people who <laughs> are oppressing you or that you believe are obstacles to the implementation of your political vision that it would just work itself out. Like that's not oh, yeah, no. really that's not like morality aside and common sense aside. That's not really how things work. Yeah, I just wanted to insinuate that. No, um, I, I think I, I think I can unpack, you know, in my mind, what you're, what you're saying, you know, basically, you know, if you're a reader of someone like Ernst Jünger or, or even <laughs> like Bronze Age pervert or something, you know, there is that reflects it. There is that understanding, um, you know, that, that violence is inherent to the, you know, that, that violence is inherent to the nature of things political, that violence is, I don't, I don't remember exactly what you said, you know, about you know evolution but you know but basically violence is inherent to the to these processes but at the same time you know if you look at the world as it is i mean there's no people talk a lot about like civil war this civil war that and obviously i think the situation in the united states is bad politically but it's it, you know it, it, we're just so far beyond i don't know if this is your point thomas but maybe it's you know resonant with it um you know we're, we're so far beyond a point where some simple hot conflict would solve anything that uh i mean yeah, oh, yeah. It shouldn't no, be exactly. for any number of reasons, but but that's one of them. Yeah. No, I make a mistake. Like you know, if you're a partisan, it, you know, people should not be afraid of violence at all. And you know, but and and they they shouldn't be averse to it. 
um, you know, you should take no pleasure in it, but you should also not be averse to it. You should not be afraid of it. You should be, you should absolutely be prepared for it. But in the same vein, yeah, you should not fetishize it and uh, you should not pine for it. Then you, you should not. And if you think, and again, you're, you know, to our common point, if you believe that it just simply salt resolves political problems, you know, all political problems are resolved at the point of a knife or the bill of a gun or by the resolution of affairs in the battlefield. Like you don't really understand politics. Um, yeah, yeah, we're in agreement. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe uh, before we get too far into the pod, maybe it's a good time to bring up Steel Storm, which I did uh, read ahead of this podcast. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, yeah, no, I would I would recommend this book to anyone uh, who's into. Uh, you know, it's really amazing. I think how many different influences you kind of channel channel into it. Uh, obviously, Dune stands out uh, as a as a probable influence, but then also um, definitely, obviously, younger is reflected in the title. Um, and I hope again, I, I never know how people feel about some of these names, but I, some of my some of the sections that as someone who's not principally as much of a, a science fiction or cyberpunk guy, although I'm trying to maybe read more of it. Um, there's a few sections that remind me a little bit of like Bukowski or even like William S. Burroughs. Uh, I'm thinking about the section of the character. Uh, Albert Chang was his name. Billy Wong. Uh, Billy Wong, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Just, sorry. You know, subbing one Chinese name for another. Uh, but about the heroin in Chicago um, and and detoxing. I mean, there, there's parts where it sort of, you, you know, it's all these, it's Dune, it's it's younger, it's, you know, cyberpunk, but then also kind of getting into this sort of dirty realism space. Um, I think, you know, for a short work, it's really impressive. Sort of well, how yeah, and it's, uh, I just wrote, I, the second one went off to Imperium Press. The second one's longer. Steel Storm Volume One was kind of an experiment because um, I didn't I didn't know if people would go for it or not, and if they didn't like that, that's fine. I mean, you know, you never know if people are are going to like, particularly something like science fiction, and particularly something that's you know got heavily theoretical uh, topics insinuated into it. I didn't know any people would go for it, so I didn't want to drop a four hundred page volume if like nobody was going to buy it and nobody was going to read it. Um, yeah, so I opted I did, to divide yeah. it up. Yeah, I opted to divide it up into five volumes, you know, each between, you know, about 100 to 200 pages. And um, I think that was uh, a good choice. Yeah, go on. Yeah, sorry. I mean, not just because I think that most people, people favor shorter stuff these days, uh, which is yeah. fine. But also, it's like, if nobody went for it, I mean, I wouldn't have been like upset or beside myself. I'd just been like, okay, well, there's not really a market for this. But, you know, people really went for it. And it's the old story has been in my mind since I was 12 years old. I, mm -hmm. I, I came with the character of Zartax when I was in seventh grade. Yeah. You know, and uh, my whole idea is, you know, because I grew up during the late Cold War, um, you know, it was like this huge relief. People don't understand, like, what a huge relief it was when the Berlin Wall came down. Like, wherever you fell yeah. on the political spectrum, there's like an existential terror of, of the threat of nuclear war that people who were born later don't understand. So that was always like with me my whole life, especially because my dad was involved in a national security apparatus, like on the planning side and things. Mm -hmm. So a steel storm wanted to build a whole world. You know, it's like, I didn't just want to write some counterfactual about like, what if, you know, in the able Archer there was a nuclear war, you know, I wanted to write, I, I wanted to write about the character of Zartax, you know, and, and all the kind of common questions of science fiction, like what is a human and like, what is consciousness? But it's also, it's like, how do you get to that point? You know, the character of Billy Wong, you know, I wanted to, it's, it's not just a, it's not just a redemption arc, but it's about how, who Providence selects for, or who the historical process selects for, you know, you yeah. can't, it's rather arbitrary. Like Billy yeah. Wong is a, is a total right. scumbag and he's, he's an evil person. Yeah. Uh, he, bec he, he becomes massively significant to the trajectory of world affairs and like a thousand years in the future, like what he did is still impactful on day-to-day -day things. And yeah, no. that's yeah. So that's what that's the whole point of it. And like people might think it's gross because he's like on heroin and he's like you know he, he's basically a serial killer. But I mean that that kind of stuff actually happens. It know? does and, actually um, happen. And I mean, yeah. I thought that part was amazing. It's like if you had uh, you know like a, a sort of William S. Burroughs junkies type character, uh, the 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 you know, the, the random, the randomness of history turns him into, if not a hero, then at least a person of, of extreme significance. And as you said, that stuff really happens. 
uh, and it's kind of this astonishing thing. Would it be fair to even say there's something kind of, <laughs> not to just name drop here, but there's something kind of Heideggerian about that, the way that history sort of unfolds or reality unfolds? No, there is. And yeah. like, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I write, Billy Wong's a composite character, like of people I know and of myself. But I mean, I, I'd never hurt women and I'd never, I never hurt anybody who I didn't have to. But I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a guy who's like sexually deviant, but you know, I, I did, I, I was, I, I was, I was addicted to heroin for seven years, you know, and I, that, that was my whole life, man. Like just trying to avoid being sick and avoid being arrested and, and having to, and having to do really crummy things. I mean, uh, to, to make sure that I could procure what I needed. And, you know, that's, um, you know, people really do go through that. And a lot of people yeah. have gone through that who you would think, I don't think people who meet me today would think, they might think weird things about me and they'd probably be correct to do so. But I don't think most people would be like, oh, that guy obviously was like, you know, he, he was like a homeless for like a year and a half and he was like a junkie. You know, people yeah. have these problems who like you might not think. So, I mean, that's, that's another thing, you know, um, so I, I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to like shed light on it too. And, and plus, um, you know, the, uh, it, uh, but more, more kind of globally, figuratively and literally, you know, the whole point of like what Billy Wong is doing and in volume two, like it, it like it, it deals with, it deals with the cop who, who ultimately arrested Billy Wong and he's got his own problems because yeah. that's world war three is looming. Like, uh, the police are being corralled increasingly into this kind of like secret police function, but it's the part of the point of it too, is that even as the world is literally going about to go to hell and it's clear that you know we're on the cusp of a general nuclear war like people are still doing their day-to-day -day thing like cops are yeah. still like you know dealing with their grimy shit like junkies are still like you know hustling for a fix you know like that yeah. you know is that and that's one of the peculiarities of modern life too so yeah, yeah that was but, that was that, very well rendered and you know i obviously wasn't around in the 80s or in chicago but the way that you know he there the specificity of like the theater that he goes into and i think he sees halloween too i mean those details yeah. Just from a from a literary perspective, I did want to say those details were really well done, and 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 the Wong character in general. I mean, just the 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 harshness of that life was was rendered in a way that I think I think a lot of people who would listen to you wouldn't necessarily think you were uh, you know wouldn't because you're you know you, you do a lot of historical revisionism and all this uh, you know political stuff. But I mean, you are a good writer. I did want to pay you that compliment. I mean, it's very, very No, well. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. And it's, and, and fiction's its own thing, you know, and it's like, I never, oh, the only kind of fiction I've ever written is like sci-fi, you know? So it's like the, um, and it's kind of like a different thing. And like some guys don't, I mean, people respect sci-fi for it's like high concepts, but they kind of look at it as being a domain of like, of like kind of geeky weird guys with like certain fixations who don't like write particularly well. So, I mean, guys who actually have literary chops like you, and I actually really, I, I really, you know, I, 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 I really appreciate it. Like when I get props from people such as yourself, because, you know, that, that tells me that I don't have any, I don't have any illusions. That I'm like some great writer, but it, I have tried to get my literary chops up to like some kind of, you know, reasonably, uh, reasonably passable standards. So yeah, I appreciate yeah, no. it very much. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. It's, it's good stuff. And I mean, yeah, you, you obviously re have, you know, been influenced by and read a lot of that sort of golden age sci-fi, right? Yeah. 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 Especially Frank um, I Herbert, haven't read nearly yeah. as much of as I'd like, but how would you kind of define? You know, it's obviously Frank Herbert's Dune, but then like, what are? What it's are Frank Herbert. It's John Steakley's armor. Like John Steakley, he died of cancer pretty young, like in his early forties, tragically. But he he only wrote two books. He wrote the book Vampires, which got turned into the John Carpenter movie. Like the yeah. book is way more is, is way is way more compelling. Like in the book Vampires, uh, th like vampirism is this kind of gross biological condition um and what and uh when when vampirism breaks out the vatican commissions these like blackwater type like private military contractors to waste vampires and like this one dude like he it's about like his like his like pmc is yeah his pmc type team that goes around like killing vampire infestations <laughs> you know and uh yeah. and, and like and uh, you, you wrote this other book called armor which is military yeah. sci-fi about this alien war where these uh you know, where these, uh, these, you know, infantry men in these, in these, in these highly powered biomech suits, you know, fight on, on, on these, uh, on, on these exoplanets, you know, where the climate's incredibly harsh and it just kind of gets to the nitty gritty of what's it like to be like a future infantry man. And like one of the features that stands out is that they have to psychologically prepare like infantry of the future. Cause they're like, when you first see an alien life form, like it's terrifying and you'll be shocked by it, but just like calm yourself and, you know, yeah, it's a monster, but 
you know, just kill it like it's a man, like don't let it get to you, like <laughs> shit like that, which actually would be like something in an in an alien war. But and finally, like Shane Stevens, he was kind of the most like brutal, hard boiled, all hard boiled authors. Uh, and he wrote this book called Dead City, which is about the mafia in New Jersey in the sixties and seventies, and it's a really, really fucking raw book, and it uh, and very true to life. Um, yeah. And he's a huge impact on me, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, like those, I'd, I'd say that like those are my primary influences. Yeah, and you bring up the term like military sci-fi is kind of its own genre within, or its own sh- subgenre, and, and yeah. that's definitely reflected in Steel Team too. It's interesting because I, <clears throat> I don't know if you'd necessarily cite Younger as so much of like a sort of textual influence, but obviously like I don't know, for lack of a better term, like a spiritual influence. Sort oh, of hugely, like- yeah. Yeah. No, no Ernest can, Younger's can, brought, go on, sorry. No, he's made a huge impact <laughs> on me. And like uh I've always uh I think of this as, and I'm, I'm, I also want to give mad props to my dear friend Carrie and some other dudes, you know, who've been in heavy combat, like who they they you know they help me a lot to write these steel storm books because like yeah. you know, I'd be like, you know, I'd ask them like, you know, they they they, they broke down for me, you know, just kind of like how things play out from a broad side view you know, in, in modern, in modern warfare, which is dope because like, I, I can't speak to that from my own experience. And, uh, right. but I always, um, I always related, you know, I, I'm like a long hair and I'm like a weird guy and stuff, but I, you know, so it seems, it, it seems out of character. I think maybe it's because of my kind of Teutonic, you know, my mom was a German. I I think it maybe it's like a hardwired Teutonic sense for order or something. Like I, I, I relate to like military guys and like military stuff, even though I, that doesn't really seem congruous with, <laughs> with you know, like with, with the way I live my life and shit. But that, uh, so yeah, I, I, I got into, I got into younger, like, you know, when I was in college and stuff and it really spoke to me and it still does. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, Cause if I had to put steel storm in a nutshell, it's like, yeah, basically I, this is too, this is too simplistic, especially given the number of influences you just cited, but you know, it's, it's like younger meets Dune in a way. Oh uh, yeah, and and younger too was one of the, younger was a sci-fi author too. It, it, I mean, among other yeah. things, like the glass bees. That's a bona fide sci-fi story, and and plus, yeah, the subtext of uh, of all of this stuff, you know, and about how uh, about how modern life, particularly like the industrial age, like it was like a war, you know, like it's, it uh, you know in, in a very real sense, and and the diminishing of of the individual personality, and it's like ultimate eradication. I mean, uh, you know, this is. And, and and you know the only way the only way to drive meaning amidst this kind of eradication of the of the, of the discrete personality of the individual is it going to lose oneself in some like mass institution you know that that that's you know that that's that's violently impactful on on the historical process you know and like just you know by kind of like losing yourself in in that in in these things you know whether it's you know the uh, you know whether it's uh, whether it's some like socialist army of like a nascent you know, like social socialized German Reich, yeah. uh, or whether it's you know uh, being part of some uh, being, being, being you know being part of some production force that you know that 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 creates you know world transforming weapons. You know, that's like all you can hope for. Like that, that's really kind of horrifying, but it's also kind of edifying and just interesting. And it you know it the the process and, and also too that and the person that's art that's about like you know the, like man and machine like machine thinking coming yeah. to pervert man. Or, or evolve him depending on your perspective but, but i mean like that, that's what zartax is like like zartax is like the literal like meaning of that process you know yeah like, like he's a man of... like force yeah he's a man forcibly insinuated into a machine but it cuts both ways too within zartax is a machine intelligence zartax is a man who's always he's like the rem- remnants of a biological man who's always in pain who's kind of horribly and monstrously insinuated into this machine but he's also a machine intelligence that doesn't want to be a human you know, and like yeah. it, it cuts both ways, you know, like uh, and that raises questions like, well, like, you know, a machine that can think like, is it alive? Like, you know, would, would right. being alive. I mean, it sounds hokey to frame it that way. But yeah, these, that's no, I mean, these are the you know, these are the chief themes of science fiction. And, and you know, in, in a work like yours, it's also, you know, married brought alongside you know, the themes of, 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 you know, military history, uh, and, and combat and, and you know, sort of more Heideggerian take on that or, or, you know, young Aryan, yeah, yeah, Ernst Younger take on that. But one, one interesting sort of thought I had while reading your, your book is that, you know, I, as you said at the top of, of this podcast, a lot of what you engage in is, you know, history and, and revisionism, uh, in, in many ways, this novel is almost like, 
revisionism as fiction. I mean, it is, it is like an alternative. It's like, it's an alternative history of, well, you know, the 20th century, but then also the an alternative history of the future, shall we say. Um, it, uh, I, you know, uh, it, it does kind of start in that place where, I mean, I don't know if you want to kind of give the basic historical setup, but, you know, basically some elements of the Third Reich, what teamed up with uh, the USSR? I mean, basically, <laughs> it, it, this develops like further on in uh, yeah. <laughs> Steel Storm 2. It, 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 it takes place, it, the, primary, the primary characters of Steel Storm, the second volume, are LeMay Alexis Huber, who, you know, a thousand years in the future, is kind of like this military dictator who holds, who brutally uh, lords over most of planet Earth. It deals with him. Yeah. It deals with Billy Wong's father, who uh, was an intelligent spook who was drafted by the East Germans um, to uh, to fight in uh, the fight the Vietnam War, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and it uh, it deals with uh, it deals with the cop who uh, who ultimately arrests Billy Wong and, and realizes what he is in some basic sense within yeah. the kind of limited parameters of his own intellect. But it the framing device is essentially that. Um, uh within uh you know uh, uh, Otto Reamer was essentially who you know was uh the no man who essentially yeah. uh who essentially carried the day in the July 20 plot against the fear um <clears throat> he was essentially able to corral uh, a cold a, a conspiratorial alliance within the the Soviet nomenclature to uh to wage a nuclear war against the United States um you know in hopes that uh in, in hopes that their forces and being could levy a decapitation strike and uh, annihilate it, and thus annihilate what they viewed as, you know, the uh, the uh, you know the Jewish regime that that had had uh, had come to dominate the planet. But within that also is uh, this one Soviet functionary who's uh, a devout Muslim. Um, he uh, this uh, this cabal reaches out to him. I wanted the fact that there's also there's a cadre of Muslims who are you know influenced by people like you know Johann von Leers, you know who have who have an identity of who have a sense of Dar al Islam as like a burgeoning you know like superpower identity, not in the sense of uh not not in the sense of a territorial uh superpower, but you know as as kind of a an empire of mind and you know uh a uh, uh a, a, an empire of people. You know who collectively, you know, uh, uh, have the fortitude to implement a true, like a truly apocalyptic uh, resolution uh, by by way of jihad. So, like these yeah. these forces come together, and uh, they, uh, they 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 attempt to levy like a knockout blow in the United States, but that does not work. Um, and uh, the result is like absolute devastation. Right. It's um, called the uh, the mega death, correct? <laughs> or referred to that, yeah. I mean, Herman Kahn coined that term. The, yeah. the the victory metrics in strategic nuclear planning were macabre, um, but they also, I mean, and some are euphemistic and some are very on the nose. Um, a mega death event, it's a nuclear assault wherein at least one million uh, human beings perish. So uh, in a, in a, within kind of the nuclear, strategic nuclear fraternity, there are references to the mega dead and the aftermath that countervalue strikes. Gotcha. Um and so that's where, yeah, and that's where I mean, there's a, there's a there's a there's a corny ass fucking metal man, you know, like who who uh, who uh, appropriated the term, <laughs> but and so people think it's like it's something from pop culture, but it's not. Obviously, Dave Mustaine was familiar with Herman Kahn or whatever, but also yeah. in the '80s, the people weren't familiar with this stuff because in in public discourse, obviously, it drew upon these things. But that's uh, right. And the I know uh, I fear so, yeah. And I mean, even if you, I mean, obviously, like it. it you know, the framing device of Steel Storm is an alternative reality, but you know, uh, 1983 was an incredibly dangerous year, and the world was very, very close to general nuclear war, and about every decade, 1950, 53, 1962, 1973, 1983, about every decade, uh, a, a real structural crisis was emerging within the strategic nuclear paradigm, and it seemed every, it seemed every cycle, the world was coming closer and closer to actual nuclear war. And part yeah. of that owed to, you know, the reduced window of decision-making, part of that owed to kind of the reduction of the input of human decision-makers and deciding, you know, when to pull the proverbial trigger. You know, this was becoming incredibly dangerous, you know, yeah. and, and just, you know, really kind of un, unmanageably dangerous. And that's that's really what caused the Soviet Union to kind of raise the white flag, you know, yeah. 
and so that's important too because people like people act like this is something that happened 100 years ago it's like look man if you're you know if you're if you're over like 45 or so when you were a little kid this is like what you were definitely afraid of man like and everybody yep. was you know it's not that's not just like goofy now it's like like you know the seasonal flu breaks out and people are like we're all gonna die <laughs> you know, nobody's we've never experienced anything like this before it's like dude this is this is nothing man like i yeah. you know it's like what the fuck is the matter with you yeah <laughs> Well, so I think you've too. commented on this elsewhere, but in terms of, you know, this uh, cyclical return to nuclear threat, um, obviously a lot of people on our side think that, you know, with Nord Stream and all these other events recently, like we could be heading back toward that. Um, you know, I think you've probably commented on this elsewhere, but what, you know, do you, do you think that we are, you know, kind of heading toward that sort of high-risk nuclear? No, I don't yeah. think so. And I, I don't either, yeah. 20th century was bizarre and there's a convergence of circumstances that basically never ever happens you know the and nuclear weapons kind of are obsolete these days okay i mean not in mm -hmm. terms of what they can do but they don't have a plausible military mission i mean nuclear weapons only they really only have a they really only have a plausible function when you've literally got two opposing blocks um and you've got uh only a handful of conflict dyads which during the Cold War obviously was, uh, you know, was uh, the inner German border and mm -hmm. uh, the other one being the Middle East. You know, if, if there'd been some kind of general Red Army invasion of like, you know, of Iran or something, then that that would have led to a, a general state of war. But, you know, this uh, it, 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 when you when you it's only a paradigm like that that can really present the danger of, of, of nuclear apocalypse. You know, otherwise you're just otherwise new in a multipolar world um, where where the where, where, where combat is where warfare itself, you know, and com not just combat itself, but warfare conceptually is more fluid. Like nuclear weapons are just kind of another sort of munition that that's just overly muscled and that's like not not particularly viable. Yeah, um, not not viable, not effective to what the targets would would even be. Yeah. That's kind of what I was trying to say earlier about political violence and civil war. Like it's like the the, the conflict is so much more fluid. It's not. Yeah, like yeah. the big danger in America. The big danger uh, in the twenty. I mean, the twenty first century in geostrategic terms looks a lot like the nineteenth century. Okay, mm -hmm. I history actually doesn't repeat itself, and that's a stupid thing people say. <laughs> but there are. But, uh, you know, the uh, the 20th century was totally abnormal. And that's the thing to keep in mind. So I mean, the 21st century, in some ways, is kind of a return to normalcy in terms of how like power political affairs develop and how military affairs kind of impact uh, the political landscape. Like the big, uh, the big, um, the, the, the big danger, I think, in terms of like individual, like normal people and like what could really, it really harm them in, uh, in sort of physical terms um you know globalism creates certain vulnerabilities and things in america don't work particularly well anymore i mean that's why like you know we have we have this ongoing problem with like logistics and getting things where they need to go you know if there was some kind of general war uh it wouldn't go nuclear or something uh but there, you start having like active shortage of the things people need yeah, you know? and, you start, yeah. and like you know people who are like kind of, kind of on the like barely making it like sliding into real poverty and then you'd have like a lot of that that would kick off a lot of a, a lot of very really bad things so you know and you start seeing kind of like a kind of a level of social violence like sight and seen really for about you know a couple hundred years i can foresee right. that no like that that dream. to me yeah. as i think you're saying that to me seems like a much more uh viable threat over the next uh 50 to 100 years is that kind of decline in in, in social order and a kind of social violence bubbling up, um, you know, obviously it's, you know, things like the supply chain issues we have now are, are, are pretty petty compared to what could be coming, but it strikes me as like that, that kind of thing could get a lot worse more so than oh, yeah, yeah. multipolar uh, nuclear conflict. That just seems more like the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, again, definitely. You know? So that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing to keep in mind. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there's definitely like existential dangers, but they're of like a very different character, but, yeah, I right. maintain people are a lot more secure now than they ever have been. That doesn't mean like life is awesome and there's no risks or anything, but it does mean that it it's kind of silly when people like go fucking crazy over COVID or the possibility of of some kind of of some kind of disease epidemic, or they think that because 
things are going to hell in Central Europe, like we're all going to die. Like that's that's really misguided. But yeah, I, I, um, I think so too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you say? I just want to clarify one thing. Did you say that you think the twenty first century is more of a return to the historical norm? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, the twentieth century was totally bizarre. Um, yeah. And that's why I mean, and it was unbelievably violent. That like you know it's like the that's <laughs> yeah. why. Um, Eric Hobsbawm uh, and Earth, it, Hobsbawm was an unrepentant Stalinist and, and just kind of a crummy guy, but you know he he did have certain he did have certain historical insights. And for a guy on the on the left, uh, he's somebody I cite a fair amount. Yeah, he called uh, he were, he said the 20th century began in 1914 and ended in 1989, and he called it the short century, as opposed yeah. to the 19th century was the long century, which he said you know began at Waterloo and Napoleon's defeat. You know, and then ended, you know, with 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 the the uh, onset of World War One. And I agree with that. And Ernst mm-hmm. Nolte, you know, he, he calls, uh, you know, he refers to the European Civil War, you know, 1914, 1945, you know, in the aftermath, um, you know, the uh, the world being divided between, you know, the two camps, you know, of the of, of, of the West and, and the communist bloc. You know, that was, uh, you know, that that was uh, that, that was the conflict to decide, like, the fate of the world in structural terms. And I basically agree with that. But yeah, no, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting way of looking at it. You know, I said um, a lot of us, I think, kind of grew up at the at the tail end, basically, of the 20th century at the beginning of the 21st. And there's this notion that the 20th, the real the, the political realities of the 20th century were some kind of norm and that. You know, if we weren't yeah. careful, we're going to go back to a World War Three scenario. But I think looking at it that way from a broader perspective, it does seem, you know, kind of like this crazy, maybe, you know, once in a millennia or who, you know, I won't put a number on it. No, but exactly. you know, not I, I, not I, normal I, yeah. that there'd be that much, oh, you know, obvious multipolar conflict deciding the fate of the world. Um, no, exactly. Exactly. That's why, well, even these, these like towering figures, these towering and messianic figures like Adolf Hitler, like Joseph Stalin, like Mao, like the, the, these guys, like the fact that there was like, you know, you don't have men like that just like all emerging at the same time unless something is really unusual afoot. OK, I mean, that's yeah. that basically never, ever happens. You know what I mean? The 20th century, like basically everything that never, ever happens, like happened simultaneously. Yeah. You know I mean, you nuts. can't. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, and that's, um, you know, you can't. There's things you can extrapolate from that about, you know, human behavior at scale you know, and about like the human condition and war and peace and stuff like that. But, you know, say acting like there's some kind of like precedent for like how things usually are like that's <laughs> that, that's nuts. Like that's not that's not remotely normal. It virtually. Yeah. And it certainly isn't like going to repeat itself. And and yeah, the, the 21st century is very much kind of like a return to the stasis. I mean, that, that's yeah, I know that's that's how it's been experienced, you know, by me so far at least and it seems to be yeah. but but that being said i mean yeah it's 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 insane you know when you really look at what the 20th century is on a zoom out level and you see just how insane it is all these people were kind of born at the same time and all these conflicts came to head i mean it's it, it's crazy as i think we've we've said a bunch of times but th- these kinds of things are still this is almost a tired point but there's that like ontological like the, these the the realities uh the the level of frankly excitement and um possibility in that conflict not that it was good but the, the oh no I, the 20th it's century still was there, an awesome you know? time yeah yeah like it was it's, like the 20th century was was fucking wild man like <laughs> yeah and we're, we're like, i mean in historically it's like not that long ago and it you know it still haunts no. us and i think and i just to bring it back to steel storm i think that's what gives a book like steel storms its strength and even some of the you know historical work that you do it's like bringing us back to that level of excitement and, and imagining how it could be different is, um, is I think a lot of the power that not just your fiction, but, but your work in general kind of has. Yeah, I like to think <laughs> so, man. And like, it's, I, I mean, I'll accept that I'm a weirdo and be okay with it, but I, it's not just me either. Who's known as these things like Panos Cosmatos, you know, he's a, he's a filmmaker. He did Mandy, which is like a dope movie. Mm-hmm. And he did Beyond the Black Rainbow. Like both of those films take place in 1983, and that's not an accident, yeah. you know. And there's a there's a European show uh, about uh, the late Cold War. Uh, I cannot remember the, the name of it, but it takes place. It's about this uh, Stasi agent, uh, you know, um, deep in the espionage game, and it takes place in 1983. Like that, like 1983 was an important year. I was like a little kid, so I, mean, I remember it, but I remember it through like little kid eyes, but it. Um, 
you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was scary times, but it was like, it was really, really compelling and really significant. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm not like, so like authors are all going to fixate on certain epochs and certain years, but in in this case, it actually, it's people are finally going to coming around and realizing that there's this really warrants like deeper study of things, not just if you were a revisionist, but, um, whatever your, uh, whatever your kind of research focus is. Yeah. I have to bounce here in a couple of minutes because, uh, um, I got to go out and, uh, and run some errands, including filling my prescription before, uh, they close up. No but problem. Then, I think what we've... else did you want to cover? We can, we can record again uh, next week sometime if you want. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, we could, we could, we could definitely have a, a volume too, but, um, you know, I'll yeah, let you I mean, go in a minute, but I guess before we get off steel storm, um, so the next book is coming out soon. Yeah. I mean, it's been, I, I Imperium press has it, it's edited. Um, we're shopping for somebody to print it um so hopefully it'll be out before the end of the year uh it should be it should be out by december okay um, great yeah, it'll be out by that. january but yeah, yeah yeah and it's and i'm uh right I'm, I'm writing a manuscript now on uh on, on international jurisprudence and the world order established by nuremberg mm -hmm. um and so that's my next uh <laughs> the third field storm probably isn't going to come out realistically for like another year or a year and a half. But, gotcha. But there's um, ultimately going to be five, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and the response has been very positive. So, yeah, the uh, just, and I mean, I, I, Imperium Press are great guys. They're dear friends of mine, and I think they're doing God's work with the kind of stuff that they publish. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, 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 it, 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 I do not mind that it takes longer for stuff to go to print with them than it would at like a bigger publishing house because they're the people I want to do business with. And, you know, they're, I, I want to support like people within our, within our political community, um, yeah. you know, uh, over just like randos or something, but absolutely. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If there's more stuff you want to cover again, I'm, I'm sorry to have to cut this short. No, it's no can, problem. I think we've been going about, about an hour, so I'll let you uh, go, but yeah, maybe we'll, we'll bring you back on for another one soon and, and we can, we can yeah, talk about some more stuff. Let me know. Maybe, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, this has been great, man. And that, uh, yeah, yeah. I really, really appreciate you hosting me and yeah, just reach out and, uh, and let me know anytime you want to record, just give me like two days notice or something. Yeah. sounds good. I'll even let you know some of the topics. Um, Aaron, totally up to you. If you want to stick around, we can talk about some of your stuff too. I'm down to. Yeah. I'm going. all good. I'm all... Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Like Aaron's got a lot to contribute and that's that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Happy to do it that way. So, um, yeah, I guess in closing, um, you know, in closing on the Thomas 777 section here, again, I would recommend Steel Storm and its, you know, subsequent sequels that are coming out to anyone. If you like some of the historical topics we talked about today, uh, just imagine those, but, you know, in a, in a Dune-esque kind of setting. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a great book, man. And uh, yeah, if you, anything else you want to, I mean, I think probably a lot of our listeners know where to find you, but any other closing sort of thoughts on? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll plug my sub stack. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll plug my sub stack. I mean, you can find me at real, R-E-A-L Thomas 777 at uh, dot .com. I mean, I beg on Twitter now. Um, I, uh, right. I noticed I that. Key account. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it, seek and ye shall find me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Very recognizable and, uh, <laughs> uh, capitalization style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, I'm on Gab and, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm around, man. And like, I, I, the reason why I, I, I set up a Twitter account is because I want to, I want to promote some of the things I'm working on. I'm launching a YouTube channel. I had to delay that owing to some, I, like, I, I got, I got really sick the other week, but then like some other, some, owing to some other shit. And I've just kind of been like getting comfortable with the software and stuff, but hopefully I'm going to stream this weekend just kind of like as a soft launch of the YouTube channel. So that's, that's, that's what I've got going on right now. And again, thank you very much, man, for hosting me. This is a very good sure thing. No, thank you for coming on. Um, yeah. Anytime, you know. man. Awesome. Bye, All right. Fellas. Take care. Yep. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Nice. All right. Well, Aaron, if yeah, you don't want to, keep you if you don't want to but um no no by by all means we can uh i got a bunch of time here so we're good great all right so let's um i think thomas is still trying to get off there we go uh let's back up have a step here um and i wanted to ask you about i wanted to ask both of you but it's okay well i'll talk, talk to thomas another time uh basically about rock and roll so you started your you know your your main web presence you started by talk you started by talking about rock and roll 
And it was kind of only after getting, not bored with that, but after feeling like you'd exhausted some of the most obvious things to talk about with music that you you started talking about politics. Is that accurate? Well, it, it is interesting because the thing that caught my attention mainly with Thomas was I checked him out on Scott Greer's podcast, Highly Respected, and he had a metal episode. He also had a Cold War one, but the one that I was attracted to was the music one. And so I just thought it was cool to have, you know, a fellow metal head that was also right leaning. And so when I reached out to him and even people can check the first video we did where he didn't have his camera on, that was more so talking about what you mentioned earlier, the generational divide. And I was focusing, I mean, it was kind of all over the place, but I wanted to emphasize that him being Gen X and me being a Zoomer, we kind of interpret like our lens at metal as a genre kind of comes from very specific places. And yeah, I don't, I, I don't quite remember how far along I was at that time, about a year ago, but I was a lot more cynical of the older folks because I kind of saw it as part of, uh, you know, what academic agent calls the boomer truth regime. And a lot of boomers are so nostalgic for their music that they often neglect how to pass it down to the younger folks because that's how it's supposed to stay alive. But Thomas was kind of leaning on my side about, yeah, the older folks kind of got to let it go and it's supposed to be a passing of the torch. But I was a lot more cynical against the older people. But the more I check out the millennials and Gen Xers, I'm actually a lot more open to an alliance between the two because I I do like the intergenerational conversations. And I think that's actually kind of essential to make sense of it. So that that was where I was coming at it from uh, the music perspective. Gotcha. Um, but I, I had I had been doing the blog since high school, kind of off and on. And it was more so of a resume thing. I I don't know if I was totally tuned into what I wanted to do with it. But uh, a friend of mine also encouraged me who also has a metal channel. And he just thought that that was like the natural thing for me to do as well. I didn't know if I was going to get an audience and I didn't really know where it was going. After Thomas, Thomas kind of the chemistry really started to uh, come together. And so it, it really was a, a cooperation project. Yeah, well, you've ended up in this fascinating place where it's like, it's. So, I don't think this is what you're doing. I think in your case, it is this very organic. Like you talk about the music and you talk about politics and very often you're talking about them with the same people. But at the same, it's almost, it almost, it almost I don't think this is your intention, but it, it's this good opsecs or not opsec, good optics where it's like, it's a, uh, it's, it looks pretty much just like you're, um, you know, t- talking about, rock and roll on youtube but then there's also a kind of political dimension right and the, the other dimension too is also movies so like yeah, right. a lot of this a lot of the stuff i grew up with and the stuff that i would talk about with my dad it's very like and my mom too but it was very it was almost like a canon that i didn't realize was a canon to me when thomas goes on the timeline and he can go from politics to pop culture that really reminded me of my childhood and I you know I wasn't around in the 70s when you had Lester Bangs and Hunter S. Thompson it kind of feels like a bygone era now but it seems like especially with like I am 1776 and all these teal projects yeah. that style especially with the internet seems to be expanding and it's kind of like colonizing a lot of these different political oh, markets definitely I mean there's it's a it's there's a renaissance of it uh, I think within our specific niche on Twitter uh, we mentioned these names the names that you bring up in your Fresno State talks and the names that are on New Right and you know all these people retweeting each other you know Stane Haynes, Catherine D, Gio Panichetti, um, yourself, my my pod you know like uh, it's this renaissance of that kind of thing which as you said Thomas is like prodigiously good at it where it's just like he can just talk and talk on you know politics and seamlessly in with these like random um, sci-fi uh books and movies from the 80s and, and 90s um but like it's all relevant it's not contrived um you know culture is uh, is relevant to politics you know you can't totally separate the two things i had a thought and i don't know if you have a comment on that i'll let you say it if you want but um i had a thought while while kind of looking at your work and and maybe 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 this will will be a compliment uh, but really, it seems like a lot of what you're trying to do is like has the same energy as that famous moment in history where Elvis met Nixon. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever had that thought before, but, you know, you are an Elvis fan and you are a Nixon fan, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's a that's a high standard to meet. And yeah, I, I don't think I, I was going to mention Elvis earlier because uh, when I started to kind of really shill that on Twitter and other places, I don't 
think it was just like a personal preference. I really do see, and Thomas has, has been a part of this too, like the idea that pop culture and, or excuse me, that politics and pop culture really have that relationship. It really started to make the stuff that I was writing about in music make more sense. Because at that time, obviously I didn't know who Thomas was in high school and I didn't know a lot of this like conceptual history stuff that people like Nigel Carlsbad are very uh, talking about stuff like that. And Book Cat, who I mentioned earlier, you know, these guys are helping me make sense of like my past and my interpretation. Right. And so it's, if I had just been doing what I was doing in high school, I'd be working with limited resources. But now I feel like I can actualize the stuff that I was talking about now that I have more resources. And so it's not like you said, I don't think it's contrived. I think in order to talk about that stuff articular or to articulate it, like I feel like that's what Lester Bangs was doing. He was combining yeah. philosophy into these spaces, not because it was ham fisted, but because I think you almost have to do that to tell it properly. No, absolutely. Now, um, a lot of people would, well, I don't think a lot of people these days would would even take this angle, but obviously rock and roll and conservatism and paleoconservatism have some would say, you know, they've historically, or by historically, I mean, over the past, you know, 50 something years, not deep history, but historically been at odds with rock and roll being like a more socially progressive force. Um, and obviously pale conservatism being the opposite of that. Um, what do you, but, but I think there, so I mean, I'll ask, I can ask that as a question, like what, you know, how would you respond to that? But at the same time, I can also provide a little bit of my own answer. I mean, I think we've kind of hit this Owl of Minerva sort of moment where it's like, yes, obviously, uh, rock and roll seemed to be the devil's music in the 70s, 80s or whatever. But like looking back on it is like this crucial part of like the cultural expression of a demographic that is now fading out and that paleo conservatism, you know, seeks to champion. So that would be, I guess, not to preface your answer, but yeah, I don't know if you have a comment on that. No, no, no. Thank you. Because uh, that kind of gets into some of the stuff I've been talking about at Fresno State is the revisionism and the elitism that is often missing when people talk about music. And that's kind of where I was back in high school. But the fact that that's how like the the reason why revisionism is so important is because like a lot of the interpretations of the, the history of music and politics. I don't I think that's how you get like the Dinesh D'Souza pop books. That's mm -hmm. how you get the, the Barnes and Noble catalog is because I don't think it's as simple as, you know, Elvis was dancing a certain way. Ergo, this is counterculture. Ergo, it's just like the hippies and the Beatles in the 60s. But to, to bring up that Nixon photo he did, I mean, it doesn't make sense to categorize Elvis in counterculture per se, because I feel like him doing gospel songs and especially like after the Beatles were popular and he never made that type of music. He had every opportunity to be that caricature, be that boogeyman that people were calling him. And he, he just never really crossed that line, in my opinion. Yeah. So it, it really I think it shows that there is a misunderstanding with the political climate and some of this new music, which was radical, but wasn't really against the values. You know, it was much right. more in line with the historic American nation. So I just feel like young people don't understand and they they, they want to go after Boogeyman. They want to purge parts of history, like uh, to bring back Nigel Carlsbad, who I'm a fan of, you know, he talks about how we can't really blame all our problems on liberalism, the enlightenment. These terms have been bastardized throughout history. And so we can't just use that as a catch all to say, here's what we're against. You know, obviously there, there are problems, but that's what I'd like to do in music. And I'd like to apply that revisionism in pop culture specifically because there is so much room for that. And it's, it just seems like no one's really focusing on it. So, yeah, no, it's it's really cool. And that's kind of a lot of what you bring up at Fresno State and in your videos is kind of, yeah, re revisionism in the way that we're analyzing these cultural particulars from like the what 70s 80s 90s especially and, and earlier what are some of the uh to ask a really basic question like what are some of the key bands for you you know I, I know Van Halen is a is a talking point but um yeah what are some of the true so with Van Halen I think that's essential for Zoomers because like Elvis even though these are like boomer bands technically I yeah. think at some point some of these things become timeless and so a sound becomes timeless and so I wouldn't wed them to the specific age group that made the music so I would say that like Elvis and Van Halen, that's essential for like young people to kind of not take themselves so seriously and not be, you know, kind of get away from this 90s grunge outlook or 
kind of how the industry has been kind of extending that adolescence, that progressivism from that era. And so to go back to some of the feel good 80s stuff that is not overly commercial, overly uh, kind of contrived, because the the stuff you hear on the radio is often very, uh, it's kind of this unfortunate cyclical, uh, just Mm -hmm. it keeps imagination in a very small category. And so I feel like Van Halen opens it up a bit. Um, As far as like create like creativity like i i i don't know if uh, thomas is taking a dig there i i know the, the guy's probably not uh, all the way uh right leaning but uh you know dave mustaine helped me make sense of a lot of geopolitics it was very yeah. confusing before i think I would... he is right leaning actually <laughs> right i, I... He, they have a song kinda... called, like, united abominations or something from more... yeah yeah his yeah. his uh recent albums have been in that direction this most recent one he kind of backed off a little bit and he's made comments in the past that are a little boomer truth ish and so again it's to address who is the real right-leaning canon who who are the people that are that have like a mel gibson moment and who are the ones that are just vaguely in our direction that we that we want to claim but maybe not be all the way there so i'm I'm trying to discover that i want i'd like people to kind of think who's who's fully on board because uh, I know that a tendency on the right is to kind of fawn over every little person who who mildly agrees with us, and so right. I'd like to make that distinction. And uh, well, what well, what do you think about David Bowie and his whole kind of white what was it white Duke? The thin <laughs> white Duke. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like I don't even I, I listen. I, I think that first and foremost, he's interesting aesthetically and I, I you know what what is private political thoughts where i don't even care that much i'm just kind of curious yeah if, what, what if you have thoughts on bowie so that kind of that kind of says most of it there because that was obviously a time and the clash was doing a similar thing at that time you know you had all this british these british riots which were kind of like the 60s uh mm-hmm. civil rights era you had all this like agitation politically and you had like british musicians like bowie and the clash who were kind of delving into some more esoteric stuff. And, you know, obviously I, I think he also got wrapped up in like some Crowley stuff and some like satanic stuff. So, you know, uh, it's not, it's not, it's not all like great, but yeah, the fact that the fact that it's like a time when like a, a celebrity would be curious to step outside the mainstream canon and find something that might even be more relatable to him because obviously there's that famous Cameron Crowe interview where he's like openly uh, supporting certain regimes or certain ideologies that are off limits. And I feel like something like that could only come about from someone who's genuinely curious about things like that. And it feels like a curiosity and the the creativity channeled through. Um, I was just talking about this on the pod I did last week. Do do you, and I wouldn't, you know, if your answer is no, fuck that guy, he's satanic, I wouldn't be shocked. But do do you have much experience of like listening to Marilyn Manson? (laughs) um i don't he's he is such a like bizarre person to me especially like i think he recently converted to christianity i don't know if that's official but he was at one of kanye's things yeah (laughs) okay okay yeah Yeah. i i I saw that that headline and so i don't know if we're in like a weird arc with him um i just to me he kind of has like the ozzy problem where he's only like the talent is around him it's not him it's it's a it's like a he, he relies on the collective. So I don't know. His music was not really my thing. And it, it was a little too try hard. It, to me, it kind of sure. fits that caricature of what people say metal is. And so I distance myself from yeah, that. No, yeah, like... he's a lot of metal. A lot of like, quote, real metal heads are not big into man. So he's just kind of he's a, he, well, he was very influenced by David Bowie. And I think there is that kind of similar thing where he approached certain ideas, uh, you know, whether, um, you know, I think the way he would have framed it would be uh social darwinism with antichrist superstar and whatnot but anyway it it, you know i guess not even to talk about manson but the one of the powers of rock and roll i guess or historically not i mean you know it's not so much anymore because there's not a lot of new rock being made but it was able you know a lot of the times the ideas were satanic or perhaps progressive or whatever but one of the strengths of it which i think now is in the toolbox or can really help right-leaning perspectives that are that are forbidden uh it is the power of transgression not not transgression not cheap transgression for transgression's sake but that david bowie pushing boundaries exploring ideas putting uh dangerous or socially unacceptable ideas in interesting aesthetic packages i mean i think that i mean i, th- I think that's something that rock and roll can do i think it's also something that you can do by by talking about rock and roll and also talking about demographics and politics so no, no that's that's the thing. I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about the hippies because that was a, a recent speech I talked about. 
And, yeah. you know, of course, back then, you know, the, the paradigm is flipped. It, it kind of feels like a boomer talking by now because I even see it on like Normie Twitter. But yeah, it, but, it used yeah. to be cool to be uh, anti-war and uh, far left. And now it's more palatable to do the opposite of that in the youth. And that's true. But um, um, it's just what was I going to say? Um, oh, oh uh, it's yeah. just that like with rock music, I, I feel like a lot of like what's happening with like Kanye right now specifically I mean the fact that curiosity is escaping the 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 usual paradigms I feel like that's where music can kind of combine that that political world together and and you can get some dialogue there because yeah like I was saying earlier with the radio stations I mean I know this might sound a little out of force but it really is like a like the Marxian like superstructure where they play mm. the same stuff and it minimizes creativity and then if something meets like an average threshold, it qualifies it as pretty good or okay. And it's just, we never seem to strive for elitism. We, the young people seem to be wanting to bandwagon off the legacy bands. And to me, that's, that's how genres die. That's how disco goes Absolutely, away and punk yeah. gets captured. And so if, if people aren't self-aware of that, if people don't have some revisionism and say, well, the music's always been there, so it's probably gonna stay. Like to me, that's so naive and young people got to be engaged with the music and the politics at the same time. And I think it minimizes gatekeeping, too, because, I mean, what Kanye's been doing recently, I mean, it, it's really hard to, like, ignore it, even if you're like a normie. Yeah. It's hard to say, like, well, I don't really understand that at all. So uh, whatever. I'm just going to chalk it up as like another weird thing. I, I think things like that are going to we're going to start seeing it more often. And I'd like young people to be ready there to support you know, the, the crazy decisions that get made. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you play music or do you know people kind of within our scene who are making music? And I, you know, if the answer is no, like I, I, I cause I don't personally, but you know, I think we're doing other kinds of art besides, I'm just curious if you know anyone who's actually um, putting. I've been, I've been uh, participating in a kind of a weekly Twitter space with uh, this guy who's been around since we, we've been together since like D live days. And he's, he was, yeah. Uh, supporter of my show early on before it, it got uh, with Thomas on board, a bass guitarist is somebody who really seems to understand that the Sunset Strip can still be alive, even if all these years there's been this big gap and a lot of those bands play like only certain venues. It's it's about like reclaiming a lot of these local spaces and kind of like localism in a sense. The fact yeah. that yeah, oh that would know, that'd be where it would start absolutely. I mean, a localism combined with the kind of online localism or online grassroots thing that we do but yeah no 100 percent. and but music is especially underground sort of music is so much more effective when live and part of a, an irl scene i think so well and also like i think a lot of people lose sight of the fact that the internet was supposed to be i think Catherine d mentioned this in an interview in her interview uh that you're supposed to use the internet as a tool but not the end in itself like the yeah. the internet is supposed to show you where the people are at and then you go there in physical space the physical space is the reward but i think a lot of people because it's laziness and just content with it being so convenient i i feel like a lot of people think that the twitter space is the scene the 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 sub stack is the place to be and you know that's not to neglect that stuff but like we're, we're supposed to move we're supposed to you know get out of that eventually but i i just yeah. don't know if people are talking about that specifically no, well, you you've done a lot, it seems, with your activity at Fresno, and you've also, I know, traveled a bit to go to different, you know, just different meetups of various kinds. So you're you're a big advocate of, of moving IRL, uh, but cautiously, but moving IRL, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's the networking. It's the network. And honestly, I mean, that's that's what the Straussians did. That's what. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, another group does, but but you know that people just are always migrating to to spaces to. Uh, I mean, that's because that's where it's supposed to be. And that's what the university setting is supposed to be. And so I, I, that's why I think the Fresno speeches are, are helpful for people because that's, it's not to say everybody should go into their class and try and red pill people. That, that, that's not the intention. It's, it's to say that, you know, there's a, uh, there's a real life component. To build something in real life. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because you don't, yeah, you don't go into people's classes and tell them your political beliefs. You, you're having right. these talks. And I, I mean, I don't know how many people attend them, but it's uh, there. You got an audience in that room from the sound on YouTube. And then, you know, if people hear about these things, they will, even if just for out of intrigue, they will come, you know. Right. No, exactly. That's, that's, I don't know if that's like coming across clear because, you know, I, I, I don't want it to just be like a glorified hobby. I want it to be, be something that, 
people can take a, a little seriously in a way. If Definitely. That yeah, right. no, I, I really enjoyed them. Um, you you kind of already answered this, but how did you, from like a paleo conservative or however you want to frame it, you know, how did you first get into this stuff? I know you mentioned Scott Greer earlier, who's, he's also kind of a, a metal guy, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's another, you know, <laughs> I don't, he picks a lot of battles and I don't know if I want to fire all of uh, them, I, but, I, but I appreciate it. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of from the, the Joel Davis school of thought where I think if we're constantly fighting, uh, it kind of sharpens the blade a little. So I, you know, I don't want to be in there in the arena polarizing yeah. people, but yeah. I, 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 I'm not like scared away from people that I like from both camps bickering. I, I actually like that, to be honest. Yeah. As long as it's done, you know, productively rather than just, you know, egoic sparring but uh but yeah no sorry I, I think i kind of derailed my own question i mean how did how did you when did you first start getting interested in and in, maybe have you always been conservative or um i i actually don't really know i i wasn't really like a political person maybe that's like a mm -hmm. zoomer attribute but um i mean honestly it kind of goes back to one of the first things you said um i, I have to give credit where credit is due i mean uh fuentes was kind of my my introduction to yeah. the canon that thomas talks about and the fact that he, you know, Nick would talk about Buchanan, Sam Francis, yeah. uh, Huntington. And to me, that was one of the main things that made me realize, okay, this isn't just like an online shock jock Howard Stern show. Like there is a canon that can be referenced and that can compete against, you know, Shapiro types and Jordan Peterson. And, you know, it's not, there's, they don't have a monopoly on the, the source material that they cite. There's actually like a whole school of thought that is being neglected. And then, Nick would also introduce me to the fact of how much the gatekeeping is really like the fact that Daily Wire is really an extension or an arm of like William F. Buckley's gatekeeping from the 90s. And then in mm -hmm. the 60s, you had the, the paleo libertarians that got kicked out to me, like yeah. seeing that whole narrative unfold. It's like, oh, OK, that's what politics is. It's not the ballot box and it's not, you know, the the YouTube shorts. It's, it's like a it's a gangster operation. <laughs> oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and something that Thomas is very and, and Brown's age perfect as well. And just a lot of people in our scene are very insightful on. I mean, it's yeah, it's the controlling of the discourse through and yeah, it comes down to relationships and networking, as, as you said. Um let me see, let me just refer back to my outline here. I think we're, we're covering some good territory. I just don't want to miss anything. Um No, and also, I just want to say, yeah, real yeah. quick, you know, what, what Nick, what Nick is doing with his operation and cozy TV, I understand some of the like personality kind of gets right. in the way of the rhetoric, but I think what people should take away from is the fact that you basically have a bunch of young people at the go galvanized and directionally in a dissident space. Um, and so something that Wendell talks about is also on the cozy platform you know, the merging of audiences is something that is very helpful. And it's not, it's, it's something that was often difficult to do, especially like 2017 and before, but I feel like, you know, there is a lot of room for unity and I, I I'm yeah. not trying to like, I'm not trying to like unite people who I personally like. And so it's like a preference thing, but I just feel like there is so much like important unity that is missing. Definitely. That the, I mean, we talked about that with that set of names, you know, that that you, you know that we mutually know earlier a, a lot of people within that group are on on different pages like yeah Catherine d is uh is conservative but she's nowhere near as like right wing as thomas but they're friends you know and like and then like you know stain haynes ha I, I mean i mean he's also right wing but it, like it's different and, and prudentialist i think is orthodox i believe and you know there's catholics there's secular people but you know and as you also kind of said like we shouldn't shy away from conflict because that's kind of pussy shit. But like at the same time, th there's a lot of needless infighting that goes on. And, um, you know, we are in fact stronger together. Uh, and especially when the unity can come, not necessarily from strict ideological adherence, but a more general approach, whether it's talking about politics through art or politics through aesthetics. And just, again, this kind of this, uh, you know, I don't want to make it sound too academic, but I often describe it as like a kind of new realm of sociological inquiry that like Catherine D engages in. Anyway, like the unity can come from things beyond simply agreeing with each other on direct matters of politics. And I think there's a lot of a lot of strength in that. Yeah. And also, uh, I've been spending probably uh, too much time, probably to my detriment in Twitter spaces. And I, I know it sounds a little hokey to say like that's the town square. But I mean, 
I'm having a lot of like fruitful conversations of, and, and like with, with women who are curious about, Hey, I see this dissident right thing going on, but you can imagine like from an outsider's perspective, it looks very weird. And I don't know if people are going to want to take a chance on like a, a bunch of people that don't really all have the same values and are also pretty like antagonistic towards women. And, you know, I, I like hearing stuff like that because, you know, there is like a conversation happening in those spaces where I'm saying, yeah, like I, I understand you can, you can pick like a handful of people that are like fed posting on Twitter and yeah. say that, wow, this thing is like, this is way too far. But obviously, you know, somebody who I cite a lot, which may sound a little random, but, you know, Kai Schwimmer, who, who's known as like Kai Clips on Cozy, he came from the TikTok world and he's a Zoomer and he's Mormon. So it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a odd personality or a archetype. But like this is like a hyper social guy because his religion is hyper social. And this guy tends to like corral people into having these like very controversial conversations about anti pornography and mm -hmm. some of the concerns politically speaking. And I know when some people look at the dissident ride as like a bunch of weirdos, I see more and more and often people like that, people who are very good at, at talking about the stuff and being palatable. And I just, I don't know if everybody sees that because people want to take the, the worst examples. Oh yeah. Yeah. Whole. Well, I think, so I got in this, as I said to you before we were recording in like 2018. And I think at that time it was like, there was the, the most sort of fed posty or, or just, you know, overtly far right type people were the ones who kind of led the conversation. And then there was a lot of people like me and like a lot of other people I knew who were there because they they knew that there's was like insights there that they weren't going to get elsewhere. But like, it was still like, it was just hard because like, it was always in that, you know, very, very extreme space. But now I think it's flipped. I think that there's kind of people with more extreme points of view, but they actually play second fiddle. Not, not that we're punching right, but like rather just that the, the, the the focus is is on people who who are in a lot much more of a gray area and for whom there's a lot more plausible deniability about what they're actually saying quote unquote or actually exploring and I think that's been one of the most major and positive changes yeah and I'm not criticizing you know the 4chan users and the people who really built this right, thing no, me neither. yeah uh, anonymous accounts and groper accounts like this movement doesn't survive without people like that but like I said with the uh, Buchanan Francis and Huntington like I took this movement seriously from an academic perspective. And when people see, you know, I mean, some of the, some of the stuff that's on the timeline is just unexplainable to, to anybody outside yeah. of sphere, but, but that's, that's okay. Like, I don't want people to look at that and go like, uh, what I hear a lot is, yeah, maybe you're not saying that, but you're associated with this thing that creates stuff like that. Therefore, I don't like it. The more and of us like, who flood in, though, the less I think that's been a thing that's happened. The more people from different spheres who flood into this general space, um, the harder it is to say, oh, you're like two, you know, two people down from Richard Spencer or something like that's not as much of a concern anymore because there's right. huge sort of middle like in ideologically middle class of people who are just who are just trying to figure it out and 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 find, you know, value in some of these paleocon or whatever <laughs> perspectives but yeah right, right yeah no there's plenty there's plenty of, of of great people in the scene and so i'm not saying water down the message at all i'm not even saying like change much of anything but like i try to communicate you know why why what unites like an academic tie and the 4chan user you know that alliance is is necessary and so i i i, I want people to to accept that and, and not reject it when they see the some of the more out there stuff. I, I want I want to explain how actually we we love both of these people. We we love the the off color stuff because they're you know like you said it yeah. brings insights. So. <clears throat> and people it's like the sallow sallow form originals like Thomas and like BAP. You know they 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 bridge the worlds really well because they know that there's a lot of value in you know fringe and <clears throat> uh, fringe online spaces and the kind of shit posting that goes on there but also are like really erudite people themselves um they kind of set the tone and you know as thomas said earlier i guess he you know had it even a sense that at some point this was going to go more mainstream and i think that's what we're seeing happening you know we're building a lot this pod you know all about self-publishing and, and all that and, and and starting discourse on books but it really is almost a whole like alternative academia in a way and i think that's kind of what you lean into you know you you lecture like a professor but like you're citing you're citing stained hanes and stuff it's really cool no and i i i would like that to be the model i mean i'm not uh as supportive as i used to be but like 
the, the Yarvin stuff and the neo-reactionary stuff, one of the things that I think made them look sexy was if you read their stuff, it doesn't all really sound academic. Obviously it is, but they really are coming from that 70 school of thought, it sounds like, or maybe it's like a Tom Wolf model. Mm -hmm. But I think what Thomas does is very academic, even if. Oh, yeah. No, he's like, it. yeah, you can tell like he's, he, you know, he's got like a photographic so, memory or something. <laughs> Just like these books. Right. Yeah, Th that's that's the thing. And so like that categorization is important. That's why I emphasize identity a lot, because what people think of as a professor is is bad news. It's the, the Berkeley liberals. It's the, the free speech movement types. And obviously we've seen like the disaster with that. And so what, what I want people to see in a historian is somebody who's curious enough to look into like German historicism and some of the people that are outside the canon. And like Thomas was saying with, you know, we, we don't want to stick our nose up at Heidegger because he's outside the canon. You know, the, it, it should be a more eclectic group of academics. And that includes people like Bookcat and Wendell going into Twitter spaces and sparring with people. And even yeah. if it looks like a, a Jerry Springer segment, no, but like, that's where the conversation's happening. So like, yeah, the, the, the Groiper and the academic are going to be in the same room, not, nodding their heads that that's the alliance. That's, that's the new academia. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, to pivot a little bit, you talk about elitism in a positive sense, uh, a good amount. Obviously there's a certain kind of elitism, which is like New York times, you know, gatekeeping elitism that we're in some ways diametrically opposed to, but you, and I, I think, you know, I certainly agree. I'm sure Thomas would BAP a lot of, you know, any really, you know, seriously rightward person is not just a populist, but also knows that like there is a place for elitism and meritocracy. Um, so yeah, you talk about, you even mentioned on this show, you talk about elitism and like as elitism as a way of kind of breaking free of the morass of, you know, being only interested in the same old bands and the sort of, uh, you know, you basically, would it be fair to say that you think we need a certain cultural elitism or a new hipsterdom or, or however you'd want to put it? Yes, exactly. And that, go, that goes back to the, the localism, because I don't think people understand how exactly rock and roll and punk rock developed. I think, I think people are under the impression that because we have the internet and because we have access to people around the world making music, they think that that means there's an international scene that's united on the internet. But what happens often, and I this is either a couple months back or probably longer, uh, I went to a show that was a band from Canada, I think Switzerland, and then a local band. And ironically, because, you know, it seems like there's a lack of uh, talent here in my area, but this guy was able to corral all these different, you know, international bands. And then I go to the concert and it's like a handful of people. And it's like that kind of that's when it hit me that it's not about talent. You know, there's talented people all over the place, but like you said, it's about networking. And so if you have that elitism within the music scene, it can create an incentive for creativity because yeah. I think, like I said earlier, like people who keep supporting bands that are legacy acts and just, they go to the same tours and you see the boomers who bring the little kids, like that's not what a scene is. That's just like keeping the, that's keeping the music on life support, but we're trying to create like a new wave, a new generation of it doing that. And you have to be picky and you even have to criticize the bands that you like and the bands that you're invested in. And a, a lot of young people have this parasocial relationship with the old bands. And I'm saying, and this is inspired by, you know, Jonathan Bowden's book on uh, cult fascism, but you really do have to have like an exclusive mindset in order to get people moving. Cause uh, I was just reading, I was just skimming real quick about, you know, uh, what is what's the guy who made a CBGB is the I think it's swank or something. But yeah. anyways, like that, that was literally like effect, like effectively, that was like a nobody who just made this club and then the scene happened. But, you know, you don't get that club if someone doesn't move the domino. So it's just about that, you know, being it's more cultural mindset. Exactly, um, exactly. You got to incentivize. I think about it, as someone who's written a book and, you know, it's like, how do you get people to read it? Or someone who has a podcast, how do you get people to listen to it? Um, you got to incentivize. It sounds almost a little like bullshit or something, but like, I don't think it is. I think it's just human nature. You have to incentivize people to want to listen to your stuff or read your stuff. You have to make them think, okay, if I read this, it's going to put me in dialogue. It's going to get me closer to this social thing that is happening. Like you don't know, as Thomas was saying, like, you know, how he, he didn't want to publish the book and have no one read it. So he made it a little shorter so people could get a more bites. You know what I mean? Like, like it's important to be able to find 
um, to, to be able to find that audience. Cause if you're just writing into the void, you know, you know, writing, writing is, is maybe a little different. Cause like I, I do write for myself, but like you want, you, you, you know, art needs an audience. And in order to find that audience, it, the, the factors that go into it, like it or not, they just don't have all to do with the quality of the art. They have a lot to do with networking and a lot to do with, um, yeah, again, that kind of incentivization where your art becomes a social thing where, you know, people gather around it. Yeah. And a concept that's kind of helped me out also might be a little forced, but, you know, I do think about the fact I remember Jello Biafra would say that mm. he didn't like how the 70s bands, they would act like they were breathing different air in the sense that the arena rock bands had this big gap and they had bodyguards keeping people away from the stage. And so there was this big physical distinction between the bands and the fans and punk rock was supposed to uh, destroy that barrier. And then I started to think about the fact that, well, if there is no barrier, more likely you're just going to get a lot of bad acts. And so you kind of need that elitism to kick everybody into gear. And it was just about thinking about that dynamic of, and it, it honestly is a little Hegelian, the fact that like the, mm. the stage is kind of like the state. And I like that we kind of have like our dictators on there. And there is that relationship between the fans that is, you know, it's like a social contract. Like they, they recognize they're not as good up there, but, but we like that, you know, we just want, yeah. we want to forge the best to, you know, create like our Ubermensch up there. Absolutely. And, and, yeah. And so, yeah, he like, it's like the Ubermensch comes from the audience technically. So it's a little populist, but it's not because we don't want the populist and we, we want like the dictator on the stage commanding. And so it, yeah, that I mean, kind of helped me conceptually. Absolutely. And you know, as thinkers of, of the right, we don't have to shy away from that. A lot of people who are kind of more on the left have to be like, oh, well, it's all about egalitarianism and like it's a, i'll say all these things that you know it's it's a it's a really small example in this case it's not important politically but like even even to talk uh, even to pretend that like a, a rock and roll show is something egalitarian is in some way to just deny human nature and to deny reality and you know one of the nice things about being on the right is that you know or, or within the faction of truth is like you know you don't have to to deny reality and you know what you said right now is interesting to bring it back to david bowie i mean i feel like that's what he, with the whole white duke thing and the the cover of um a lot insane you know i think he he understood himself as a as a dictator <laughs> so right kind of, right and it's yeah. like you know it's just that's where the music and the politics like physically you can see the the overlap but like you said i mean this that whole talk about you know there's no i think uh uh, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden said in one interview, like the only difference between the band and the the fans is we just so happen to be on the stage. And I don't really like that. A nice because... sentiment, but it's not true. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. And so it's not to spit on the fans, but it's just to recognize the fact that it's to confront the inequality. And so one way for people to kind of uh, to see that inequality is just to think about, you know, I mean, obviously these guys are on a different level. And so it's about applying that thought thought process to everything else because you know like the boomer truth is that equality is a given and the discourse has already been settled and so we don't have to debate about uh you know human human diversity and it's just like that it's so hard to have that political conversation and so maybe the place to really have it is just hey man think about your favorite bands and how you can't do yeah. that stuff no Why totally and that's yeah i think that's what a lot of your stuff is all about is that kind of outside the box unconventional style of thinking well we've been going for almost two hours so i'll let you go soon but i do have a couple more things i think we we could talk about um yeah. where they go um one thing that we have in common and i would have asked thomas about this maybe if we do a follow-up i can bring it up because he i guess also lived in la for a while but we're both we both live in california so um you, you're up there in fresno right i am i born am. and raised yes uh cool. yes yep. no i'm in la i'm a east coast transplant like so many others but not even harp on that I, I i did i'm just here's just citing like another video or another podcast but i did think your conversation with thomas about how he kind of doesn't buy that california became a blue state um in as organic as a way as people think uh you know over seemingly overnight between between reagan and and, and bill clinton um, i wonder if you have any thoughts on that or also just any general thoughts you have about living in california uh would you like it here are you trying to get the fuck out or, or what <laughs> no uh funny enough and i hear this with like normie republican types but i uh i want to continue something that john miller said 
because he's really been uh, driving this home in a Twitter space. But, you know, I, I do think like being a California nationalist is still cool. I, I yeah. still think we need to I don't think we should run away from our own roots because we apply that on the national level. I would never leave America because it's my home. But then people are so malleable going from state to state. I, I don't really like I don't think that's a consistent logic. So I, I, I am still in love with California, the, you know, the birthplace of uh, Nixon, not Reagan. Right. But but like, huh. you know, those sunset but still, strips. No. And, yeah. Have you been to yeah. your, have you been to like Nixon's birthplace in your Valenda? That's a place I haven't been to go. Yeah. I went to the, the Nixon library a couple months back and nice. it was just it was honestly very Lynchian. It was very, yeah. uh, they really, they really make it artistic the way they deck out all his stuff. And so yeah, that, I've been to the Reagan it. library in Simi Valley, but I'm trying to go to the Nixon. Uh, the Nixon oh, stuff is more interesting to me, obviously. Uh, but no, I, I love being here too. Like for, and I'm in LA, so it's more liberal than Fresno by a long shot, but like, uh, but still, I mean, there's a lot and bronze age pervert talks about this. It's just, it is still, uh, you know, just the natural beauty of the state. Like it is still a good and cool place to be the social, you know, I wouldn't want to live in San Francisco. I like the Bay area, but I wouldn't want to live in San Francisco due to some of the social issues, but honestly in LA for as bad as some of those social issues are like, I mean, you know how LA, anyone who's been to LA knows how it's laid out You're pretty insulated from it. So yeah, like I don't have much love for Gavin Newsom or anything, but like, yeah, I also am a proud Californian. <laughs> yeah, but, no, no. In yeah. California, uh, for better and worse, I mean, was able to project. Oh, you're a little muffled. Area. Sorry. Oh, excuse me. Uh, no worries. Yeah. You were saying California for better and worse. Yes. Um, the fact that California really is like the American frontier in the sense that um, mm -hmm. I think uh, Thomas would cite zero to one as an example of that and Paul Fahrenheit too. But um, the fact that for better or wor and worse, California really was like a cultural imperium that everybody else kind of uses as a model anyway. So I feel like people are, you can't really separate California from the story of, of the world in the last few years, I don't think, because a lot of the organic local culture comes from here. And so I'd like people to have a, a better, you know, mend with that and heal with that because, you know, for, for all the, uh, the negative things that we produce, like the hippies and the, uh, yeah. I don't know our stance on the Valley Girl question, but for every one of things like yeah. that, <laughs> we, we also do get like rock and roll we get a lot of different breeds of music and so oh this definitely. Might, this, yeah it, it may be the place where a lot of the innovation comes from because uh another one of my favorite people on twitter uh Barack obama talks about how uh, uh a lot of the most far-right trump admin adjacent people is we're from california like uh stephen miller and people like that oh yeah and, no there um, it's uh you you kind of you're either going to be totally spit with the wind in California or you're going to be kind of red pilled and have the, like a much more sober, like it's not like the, the social realities that are kind of plaguing the rest of the country. It's like, it's not just like, holy shit, what's going on. It's like uh, in California, you just have a much more sober, like, okay, you know, you, you've seen kind of demographic shifts and all this other stuff. And, and you've seen it in a context where, you know, the weather is nice enough or whatever that like, you know, the issues aren't always, like really at the forefront, like at your doorstep, it's kind of just a much more passive, like just chill place to be, not to speak in too many California cliches. So it's like, you just, you see all this stuff and then you go back to your house and enjoy the weather and you think about, yeah, and you, you end up with someone like Michael Anton or Stephen Miller, where it's like, they're really based, but they're not like, you know, th th their understanding of it is just much more like sober. And, and they, they, oh, I guess crucially, you know, what I'm maybe a part of what I'm really trying to say is in terms of the social reality of living here and the people you rub shoulders with, like you understand how, how, how liberals think and you're able to get under that in a way, you know, the same could probably be said for some, you know, conservatives on the East coast too, but I don't know if there's something about the California, you know, right winger that's just uh, kind of more galaxy brain about some of this stuff, I think. No, yeah, it's 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 the personality, it's the Van Halen energy, and it also is probably a part of a byproduct of acceleration because obviously somebody who's living in like a red state often doesn't have the incentive to have a right wing flank, you know, pay attention mm -hmm. to that stuff. Whereas people in blue states kind of have a wider palette, it seems like, because like you said, they're living in it. So I, you know, I maybe I'm I'm simping here, but I I, I still love the state. You know, oh me is, too, and we. Yeah. We got everything. We got the beaches, the mountains. We got everything here. So, oh yeah, no. So I mean, I, it's yeah. cool. It's a cool state. Yeah, no. Definitely. Let me know if you're down in LA. We should, uh, we should hang out. Oh, dude, <laughs> I was just, I was just yeah. there recently. I was trying. To, I know I trying you were to there to try to get in for Sam Hyde, right? Yeah, I, I was trying. I, I didn't have a ticket. 
it was also a, a very like alt alt girl scene so it's uh yeah it's, i, it's I looked at the there. event invite for that I, I also had thought about going but I, I i couldn't even figure out what it was supposed to be there's a lot of that's like the new social realities like these weird exclusive events that you have to like pay to get in and <laughs> i'm not necessarily <laughs> against it, it kind of ties in with what you were talking about with like how you do need to create that culture right uh, i mean i i don't want i don't want the only person doing this to be, you know, Yarvin doing his ballroom events, you know, everybody should be trying something. We shouldn't wait for yeah. you know, some no. guy to just do it on a whim. It should be a, a local thing, you know? Absolutely. And I think uh, there's a kind of a scene, you know, people have called it, I guess the dime square scene. I don't even really know what that means uh, in New York. <laughs> you know, there's a New York scene, but I think there's, you know, I, I think maybe there'll be more of a, of an LA scene in the near, or not even LA, but like California scene in the near future, I think is enough of us here. I know, you know, Matt Forney is taught, there's going to be a terror house reading, I think in New York, I don't know if it's announced yet. So I don't want to, you know, jump on that too quick, but, uh, but I think there may also hopefully a terror house reading in LA at some point in the near future. Oh, like, nice. You know, nice. Gonna be but, um, you know, the lot, this is, uh, this is kind of a random note to end on, um, but it's the last thing on my list. Uh, you've written also, but it's related to California. You've written about David Lynch's Wild at Heart. And I just wrote this piece that BAP just retweeted last night in a moment of significance to me um, about uh, David Lynch's meditation and his work in general and kind of tying that in with some of the more sort of esoteric Buddhistic ideas in Bronze Age mindset. So I guess to frame it as a very simple question, your, your piece on Wild at Heart was really cool. Uh, kind of about, it's actually been a few weeks now since I read it, but it was, you were sort of writing about, you know, the Wild at Heart as, as basically as a Western, right? And as, or, or maybe that wasn't the exact point, but I guess my question is, to what extent do you think Lynch's work, you know, sort of reflects the foreclosure of the West or like the, the death of the American dream? Yeah, I think effectively he's a pre-modern man in modern times. That somebody on yeah, Cozy, of, yeah. all, of all people, was uh, kind of someone who helped me think about that more holistically. But yeah, David Lynch, when he, with Twin Peaks and Wild at Heart especially, that one's a little more on the nose. But I, I feel like a lot of people write it off as like a weird road movie. But, you know, with the Nick Cage character mimicking the, the Elvis tone and uh, Laura Dern is like the Southern Belle traveling yeah. across the country and starting to see the decline, you know, firsthand. And, you know, they, they try to cope with it with heavy metal, which is, you know, it, it just feels like it's a movie just for me. It feels like he's just Definitely. pandering to yeah. my demographic. And so I feel like a lot of that stuff goes over people's heads. The, the Twin Peaks stuff, I mean, and Blue Velvet too. I mean, he really hones in on Americana in its peak and people getting away from that because of lust and evil and all this stuff corrupting it. And yeah. so I, I, I feel like that is just such a brilliant way to explain, like you said, you know, explaining these dissident views that are actually all around us, like Jonathan Bowden says in Pulp Fascism, you know, people, whether they don't know it, are like sympathetic fascists because <laughs> the, 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 the comic books and the Pulp Fiction uh, like is, is making people care about strong men. And it's, it's about commentary on masculinity in yep. media that people don't even realize. They feel like, yeah. again, with categorization, they think that like, uh, you know, a superhero is just like a vague thing. It's, it has nothing to do with Western civilization, has nothing to do with America. It's just like a concept. It's like a Greek abstract thing. And I want people to realize, no, like all that stuff that you like, strength and order and authority, that stuff is, is part of your diet and you should accept it instead that, yeah. of run away from it. And Absolutely. So I feel like yeah. David Lynch. Oh, no, no, that, that, that um, man, that artic I think that articulates kind of the point we were talking about earlier with, you know, exploring some of these questions through popular culture really well. Have you read much Camille Paglia or do you know who she is? I, I, I keep hearing that name cited. She's like a feminist type though, right? What, what's the deal Not, there? Okay. It's, I don't even want to oversimplify. You have to almost read her. She has to be read to be believed. I mean, yeah, she is sort of of the left. She it would be considered a quote unquote dissident feminist. Um, but she has a lot uh, of value to offer. Her main book is Sexual Persona, one of the favorite books of David Bowie to, to you know, bring that name up again. Um, I think what people cite in her is she's really hard to categorize politically. She's not right wing like you or I might be, but she's like she she has this rich understanding basically this is exactly what you taught you just mentioned how these pop cultural figures you know kind of stand as archetypes for values that are essentially just more in line with with human nature and you know she doesn't understand herself as right wing but when you really delve into human nature 
in the way that she does, I don't think anyone can avoid being at least a little bit right wing in, in the recognition that, you know, we are drawn to power, for example. I don't want to oversimplify Polya, but I do think, you know, obviously there's a lot to read, but I do think she's someone whose book you could enjoy uh, if you got to it, because I think what you're talking about with superheroes, but I think it also applies to, you know, the to, to heavy metal and to the rock oh, yeah. star on stage, you know, basically the, the Polya, it's like, people appreciate her not just for her what she says specifically politically but her for her whole methodology of reading culture and i think it's very much in line with what you're with what you're trying to do okay no that that is interesting i find myself also don't want to come across the wrong way but i find myself reading a lot more from women and yeah, specifically no. millennial women and so it, i'm in a weird arc right now my uh my uh my my reading list is uh looks looks very girly right now so i'm trying to <laughs> no it's it's of course it's i mean there's there's topics where you know a female perspective is you know very beneficial i think but um yeah i guess closing thoughts then on on lynch like um wait so you said he was he he was a pre-modern man in modern times which i completely agree with uh, i'll maybe I'll, i don't i don't like to send too much writing to people like after we do pause but maybe again bap just retweeted this so uh he it's co-signed on by him i guess I'll, maybe i'll send you the article because that was basically what i was trying to articulate is that you know he you know lynch will say a, a kind of crypto base thing not like full mel gibson thing every few years but then he'll tow the party line about blm or ukraine or whatever but so but like so I'm not, i don't know if specifically where he stands politically but i just think his essence as an artist is as you said um a pre-modern man in modern times did you say someone helped you on your understanding of that or there's like a yes that that was somebody on cozy um on cozy yeah and so i, I would recommend people again like i i stumble on this stuff and it's not even from like academic type streams where i i hear stuff like that yeah. so even some of the more like uh irl live streamer types you might people might be surprised the kind of stuff you hear but um yeah a, a note for me to end on i mean my whole goal and my whole shtick with what my brand is um with lynch people like lynch are respected and i want them to continue to be respected but like you said this this pre-modern man in modern times is often vulnerable to the boomer truth that academic agent talks about if, if people don't know like i don't know how much that's like known in the vernacular like academic i actually agent, didn't know it before this conversation but it made almost immediate sense yes the boomer truth the post-war um, right but yeah. uh, there there's there's a series like a playlist explaining like exactly what it is because it it's not just like a like an older guy you know shouting at a cloud what's the simpsons quote but, yeah. but anyway uh, it, it's also like boomer truth is what Thomas talks about the Nuremberg narrative, what, right. what he talks about, like that whole, like not looking at history after 1945. And so all the assumptions and the principles of equality and egalitarianism. So that, that's what Boomer Truth is. But with Lynch, somebody like him is like almost all the way there. But because he, you know, has to toe the line. And I mean, that 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 infamous Trump moment, that quote that he said right. about him and then he, yeah. back, he backed off like. I, I still think that's like the Bowie thing where he is in, engaging with it genuinely, but he he retreats back from it. And I want the the like future generation to like cut that out of the diet and and just you know recognize that these two things, like one can be abandoned and one is is authentically based. And so yeah, it's just no, about no. recognizing well, those, those identities and reactions. So. It was actually on your Twitter feed, Aaron, where I, I didn't even know this existed, but I thought it was an incredible 20 minutes of David Lynch on Alex Jones talking about how he was open to 9-11 conspiracy, which is like uh, somehow memory hold because, you know, David Lynch, one of the interesting things about him is that he's beloved. I mean, he's married to someone who's like 40 years younger than him. He's the type of person who like a lot of leftists and especially feminists would like dislike, but people love him. I remember in college, you know, everyone, everyone from the right to, prog you know, progressive hipsters loves david lynch so so but so so i guess this alex jo alex jones seems to be the most hated you know person in the world with the amount of money they want to get from him now but you know they they were in each other's orbits at one point it's an incredible 20 minute interview but no that's that also articulates i think what, what you said um that he it, you know he is engaging with these questions lynch i think shies away from specific ideological um allegiance and oftentimes he just shies away frankly from language and from words itself and you can even hear that on the, you know, Alex Jones is very, my comment on it was like, you know, Alex Jones is very literal minded trying to get at the heart of the matter. You know, was 9-11 an inside job? <laughs> Literally is like, well, some things that didn't add up. Um, it's a big mystery. And uh, once people start asking these questions, they're not going to be able to cope. But 
man, is it a mystery? And like, also you should meditate. Like that was basically <laughs> what he said, but I think that's awesome. You know, I think that there is a place for the Alex Jones of the world and people who, you know, say really on the nose things. But I mean, as a writer, actually, frankly, myself, even though this podcast is fairly discursive, I, I think I move a little more in a David Lynch direction where I think just kind of touching the line and then letting other people interpret, <laughs> I think there's a real, real power in that. Yeah. Yeah. Having the, having like a fan base that can interpret that and understand it. And then everybody else is also along for the ride, but maybe not aware of that dynamic too. Like I know Curtis Yarvin has been kind of trying to do that in a different way. And I, I don't really like his model of doing it, but I think like what Thomas does where you can't really write a hit piece article against him because you would just be so overwhelmed by all the, the content and all the different tangents and this and that. It's like, it almost, like you said, it makes the distant perspective immune to like categorization. And these guys are just like, you know, far right people in Germany. Well, not really, because they're like, they're talking about rock and roll and sci-fi that, yeah, that doesn't no. really gel with like people's interpretation of what, uh, you know, uh, fascism is. It, it, it's, it's not really that same it's gotta thing. got to keep it's, evolving at a rate faster than them. I mean, I think that's, we just got to keep moving faster than they can. And then we're uncancelable. We're not, we're, we're not uncancelable, but like, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're ahead of them. We're of adapting to like post-modernity in a way. And we're doing it better than they are. You know, whoever they is, by the way, I'm not trying to like be too uh, yeah, yeah. I just mean the powers that be. <laughs> I mean the, you know, the controllers of the, the narrative, shall we say, but um, no, no, it, it's very doable. I remember this is a, I, I, I'm not just bringing like trying to like quote this to be cool or something. I think it's a Peter Thiel quote though where he said like part of the, the name of the game with tech was to always like stay a little bit ahead of like the laws they were passing. And I think there's something to that kind of not even quite accelerationist and like a Nick land sense, but you know, th of that, you know, fast moving logic where, where you, you can stay ahead of the curve. You can, you know, you can basically, you can avoid the sensors and the people that want to tear you down by, by, by moving faster than them. I think it's a powerful, powerful idea. Yeah. And uh, to cite Barack Obama, cool guy, by the way, cool guy. And he uh, he was ripping pages out of uh, um, Peter Thiel's book that he did with Blake Masters. I think I think that one's called Zero to One. The thing I'm thinking of is, I think, maybe something different. But anyway, uh, less than that zero. book. But anyway, yeah. Oh, less than. Zero. Yeah, that's what oh, I thought. Yeah. The, the Brady Snellis book about California. But yeah. Yes. So so Zero to One kind of gets into, I haven't read the book, uh, but it's the the stuff that I've seen cited was talking about, you know, how is the tech world going to adapt after the 2000s because we got the internet now and, you know, what what is the philosophy that's going to drive all this cultural change? And so I, that's, a, that's a bit vague, but I mean, someone who's even thinking vaguely on that level is a lot closer to us than somebody who's trying to like gatekeep yeah. for uh, security purposes. No, so. No. It's interesting. It's interesting to, to say the least. For sure. All right. Well, I think we're about coming to the end here, but why don't you tell our audience like where they can find you if they don't know? We already talked about your YouTube Loud Sound Epicenter, but you know, you're on Twitter, whatever you want to plug. Yes. Yes. So I think Twitter, I know people are black pill because our guys keep getting banned. I just like California, don't become a refugee. Don't go somewhere else. Stay on Twitter. There's still yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. People come back to the Twitter spaces are popping. Twitter spaces is like, the uh, you know the trash TV talk shows in the '90s, the real dialogue is happening there. So uh, Aaron Ryder AC, a uh, uh, writer with a W, is uh, that's my Twitter. And then I I've been neglecting my uh, my stub stack. I think that's it. What is it? Aaron, it's hard uh, to Aaron do, Cummings consistently blog, but yeah, no. Aaron, go on. Sorry. I think it's uh, I don't know what the is it dot substack dot com. Or, let's look it up. Hold on. Um, but yeah. Hold on. Yeah, and there's some good stuff on there. I read, again, I read the Wild at Heart piece and some other things, but you, you talk about, I believe you say that, you call it like random commentary, right? No, that's not the yes. next. But you, yeah, which again, that I think is case in point. You know, this is about ostensibly random commentary, which actually ends up focusing on a pretty, you know, specific message that's both political and cultural. But anyway, that is Aaron Cummings, A-A-R-O-N-C-U-M-M-I-N-G-S dot substack dot com. So people should check that out. And um, yeah, yeah, I think that's um, not a wrap, but let's, yeah, we'll, we'll get in touch with you and, or, you know, we'll through you um, and maybe do a follow up with Thomas um, in the near future. I'd come on your, your guys' stream if that's easier too. Um, I think, you know, I feel like we could talk for hours. So thanks a lot for coming on and have a great uh, rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So.